Talk Show. Recorded live. Hello, this is Michael again, and um, I'm with Jorg from Juggler 66, and also Tom Fress uh, uh, has joined us as well. Um, Inquisition update is his show. Um, sounds like we're going to have another interesting and informative show here. And uh, so once again, I'm going to let Jorg take control of the show and uh, lead us in discussion. So thank you, gentlemen, for both being here and for those that will be coming. So, um, How are you doing, Jorg? I'm fine, thank you. And uh, thanks for the invite, Michael. Uh, I hope you can enjoy your time. Um, uh, I think you spend your time a little bit with your son, I hope. Uh, while we are doing this broadcast here, so you will be a little bit in the background, but feel feel invited to jump in anytime you want to. And of course, I want uh, to say a warm welcome to Tom Press, who is really an icon on the internet to me. I mean, when you see uh, what Tom Press has all done, uh, just go visit his website, uh, Inquisition Update, and you will get a little idea. And of course, my much promoted. Uh, reading that he did on uh, uh, on another talk show site on uh, Henry Gretton Guinness, Romanism and the Reformation, um, that still to this day I think is uh, next to the Bible, <laughs> a, 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 a book that every Christian should, uh, should have read, or everybody who uh, at least calls himself a disciple of Jesus, or something like that, because this is really wonderful. Welcome, Tom. Yes, good, uh, good evening, Yerk, and nice to be with you and also Michael, and uh, anxious to see what you, uh, you brought to the table today. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, because you haven't been uh, online lately very much, and uh, you have not followed our first broadcast that we did uh, here on uh, Talks Radio, I wanted to give you a little bit of summary what it was all about because uh, we did, I think, about uh, eight or nine hours show uh, just on uh, things like uh, generally talking about the Jesuits, uh, the connection of the Supreme Military Order of Malta uh, to the world, how they are uh, infested in the world, how they are connected uh, to national and international organizations, how they rule a lot of stuff, and of course that the so-called SMOM, so the Supreme Military Order of Malta, is uh, controlled by Jesuits at the top, and by that, of course, uh, just another arm of the Roman Catholic Church in their hierarchy. Uh, one of the uh, interesting things that we were talking about last week was um, a 10-point plan by Ellis Bailey for a new world order called the Externalization of the Hierarchy. And uh, as introduction for this evening, for the listeners who don't remember that well, maybe, when they heard it, or for, this, for first-time listeners, I want to say, um, I just want to read these uh, 10 points that Alice Bailey, who is uh, associated with uh, Madame Blavatsky in the finding of theosophy at the end of the 19th century, and she was the founder of a uh, company called Lucifer's Trust that a few years after its foundation changed its, na- changed its name into Lucifer's Trust, not to make the connection to Lucifer that obvious as they did. They also changed the address from, I read it somewhere, I can't uh, get it out of my head right now, it was uh, somewhere 666 some street. And they changed that also because it was all too obvious, too much in the face. But, you know, these 10 points, uh, this, this charter that was proposed by Alice Bailey, and by that uh, through, the U- through the United Nations, is a charter that when you read these two points and, uh, 10 points and you analyze these 10 points, you will see that they have uh, achieved a lot in the last 50 or 60 years when you look around of how our society is right now. And uh, I would start with the first point to take that uh, back into our memory. And that the first point that she made was take God and prayer out of the education system. So I don't want to go too deep into this, but uh, as you all know, probably in 1963, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, 
in the United States of America, the morning prayers in the school system were taken out. Um, the point of Alice Bailey was, she said, change curriculum to ensure that children are freed from, the, uh, freed from the bondage of Christian culture. Why? Because children go to school to be equipped to face life. They are willing to trust and they are willing to value what is being given to them. If you take God out of the education, they will unconsciously form a, res uh, a result that God is not necessary to face life. They will focus on those things the school counts them worthy to be passed on, and they will, uh, and they will look at God as an additional if one can afford the additional. Yes, uh, well, uh, I'm going to confess to you and to, and to the listeners that I have not yet read uh, Alice Bailey's uh, externalization of the hierarchy but I've read a lot about it. It's referenced by many of the authors uh, that I've read. And, uh, of course, um, they worship Lucifer. There's no doubt about it. And uh, they're not even very uh, secretive about it. And, as, by the way, uh, uh, Alice Bailey and also uh, Madame Blavatsky, uh, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, were Freemasons. And they were... Uh, uh, under the control of the Jesuit order. And uh, uh, since Freemasonry is simply uh, a Jesuitism by another name, and they have an agenda to uh, counter the Reformation or counter the true gospel of Jesus Christ and to replace that with a global uh, religion that worships and honors Satan. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, neither Blavatsky nor Bailey will accept the name that God gave Lucifer. Uh, Lucifer's name was changed at his fall. And uh, to call him Lucifer now is literally rebellion. Uh, God changed his name. God created Lucifer. He is a created being. And uh, after the fall, uh, God renamed him Satan. So anyone who uh, refers to Satan as Lucifer has rejected God's authority and is in rebellion. And uh, obviously we make mention of his former name because they do. But I never refer to Satan as Lucifer, because, because God changed his name. And, uh, uh, but Madame Blavatsky and Alice Bailey and many Freemasons uh, refer to him as Lucifer because they are in rebellion against God. And, uh, you know, it, Lucifer said in his heart that he would ascend above the heights of the clouds, that he would uh, sit upon the mount of the congregation at the, in the sides of the north, and that he would be like the Most High. And God's immediate answer to him was, And yet thou shalt be cast into hell, into the pit. And so uh, Satan, formerly known as Lucifer, is in rebellion against God, and so is Alice Bailey, and so is Madame Blavatsky. And this book, entitled Externalization of the Hierarchy, just means exposing the hierarchy to the world. The, the hierarchy of the New World Order, obviously, the top of which is Satan. And uh, that's why she originally called her publication Lucifer Trust and changed its name to Lucis Trust because it might have awakened uh, true Bible-believing Christians in this country. And uh, 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 even the, the, the mailing address for the place. Uh, but nonetheless, this book, while I don't recommend it, for the average uh, Christian, for those who are researching the New World Order and the Roman Catholic Church and uh, what role the papacy is playing and, and studying the Jesuits, 
this is a re- a good resource uh, book to determine what their stated plan is. And number one, number one is to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out of the public education system. Get the Bible out of the schools. Now, I want to remind the listeners that in the early 1800s, the Roman Catholic Church criticized the public school system because it was uh, godless, they said. And so the Roman Catholic Church created the parochial school system where their version of Christianity, or rather anti-Christianity, could be taught to Roman Catholic children. And uh, uh, Rome has, all, has a history of, of just unlimited efforts, repeated and continual efforts to take the gospel or to keep the gospel out of the hands of the people. First of all, tying up the scriptures in Latin and forbidding anybody to translate the scriptures into the vulgar tongue or the, the, the tongue of the people so that they could not read it for themselves and then liberate themselves from that Antichrist church. And, and the strategy that Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and Alice Bailey took was that which Rome had already established as the main focus of this Luciferian uh, global government, and that is to get the Bible out of the hands of children. And I want to remind the listeners also, it's a matter of Roman Catholic canon law, where the papacy claims the sole sovereign right to educate youth. Okay, every education system must be handed over to the authority of the papacy. And, of course, the papacy delegated that authority, that authority to educate to the Jesuits because they were the most astute at educating. And as we all know, the most prestigious universities around the world are Jesuit universities. Jesuit universities, colleges, uh, high school and elementary schools all over the world run by Jesuits. They're called the great educators. When anybody uses that term, the great educators, you know they're speaking of the Jesuits. And so the papacy, the Antichrist of the Bible, has delegated the education of all youth to the Jesuits. And even our, our public school curriculum, our syllabus, is, is dictated by the federal government, which is controlled by the Jesuits. And, uh, and that's why they were so successful in stripping the gospel of Jesus Christ out uh, of the public school system. It is, it is one of the main weapons in the Jesuit-led counter-reformation. First, you have to strip from the minds of children any correct knowledge of God and then focus on a system of education that denies the creation, that denies grace and salvation in Christ, and puts upon it uh, an obligation to kowtow to this new world order system, which depends upon men for salvation and not Christ. And uh, the, the entire education system from kindergarten through graduate school is supportive of this anti-Christian education, this anti-Christian direction. So Alice Bailey and and Helena Petrovna Blavatsky in this work entitled uh, Externalization of the Hierarchy, they're simply telling us, they're simply telling us, uh, revealing to us the new the new hierarchy, uh, the pecking order of this of this coming Luciferian order in the world, this global government, global religion, 
global social and global economic system that's being imposed upon us, and it's only successful because they've stripped the correct knowledge of God from the education system in in every level. So I, I didn't mean to go on so long with that, but but I, I think for people to understand for, uh, better what you are going to say throughout this program, that they have a basis for understanding what you are exposing to them. Thanks, Jerk, for being patient with me. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, what you just did is the reason why I wanted you to have on the call, because you are so eloquent in explaining uh, these things to our listeners, even a little bit better than probably I did before. Um, but there's one thing that you said, and uh, I, I, I'd like uh, to come back to that. You said that uh, Alice Bailey and uh, Helena Petrova Blavatsky were... Um, Masons. I am yeah. self. I am self. Do not know if they were Masons or not because I don't know so many female Masons. But I know, and this is a very interesting com uh, connection that we can make, that at least Helena Blavatsky was controlled by Albert Pike. Yes, that's and, true. And he is the author of Morals and Dogma where on one of the pages he absolutely states that they follow the doctrine of Lucifer. Right. And by that, I think that it's very, uh, very interesting to make that connection, uh, also to Albert Pike, because uh, what, what I have learned about Albert Pike is he was not only a, a, a 33rd degree Freemason and the highest Freemason in the United States of America, uh, he also was... Uh, able in, uh, to communicate in 16 different languages. He used some Indian tribes to um, exterminate Protestant settlings in the United States of America uh, during the Civil War and, uh, and the time around that. And he is a person that uh, one everybody uh, that everybody has to take into account to when talking about Freemasonry, Albert Pike. Not only, but surely also because of his famous letter that he wrote in 1870 to Mazzini about the coming three world wars. Yes, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that is even referenced in externalization of the hierarchy, the three world wars. Uh, I may be mistaken about that, having not read the, the uh, document myself, but uh, certainly Albert Pike and Helena Petrovna Blavatsky were uh, de joint de demons. I mean, uh, so was uh, Alice Bailey. And if you, the, the more you get into the study of uh, uh, Blavatsky and Bailey, you'll discover that they were Freemasons. That's admitted. That's on the surface. So. Mm -hmm. just, okay, just, so I, wa I want to remind the listeners, and don't forget, this is very important, that Freemasonry is simply Jesuitism by another name. Jesuitism is Jesuitism no matter what they call it. And, of course, what is the most hideous about Freemasonry was that Rome, or the Jesuits, rather, found a way to recruit nominal Protestants to join that organization and ultimately serve the papacy's aims for a new world order. This is what, to me, is the most hideous of all about Freemasonry, that it focused its attention on enlisting and recruiting Protestants to join its, its, its ranks and literally to use the backs of Protestants to bring the counter-reformation to the world. And, and anyone who calls himself a Bible believer or a protestant has defied his own faith, defied his own faith in joining Freemasonry an oath-bound organization, a highly secretive and allegorical uh, society that is dead set to remove true Bible Christianity from the face of the earth and to assist the Jesuits 
to uh, create a godless society. And uh, any anybody who belongs to Freemasonry, uh, well, has repudiated the gospel of Jesus Christ. He can't serve two masters. And 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 the the chief of every Masonic lodge is referred to as the Grand Master. And uh, they do Lucifer's bidding. They call him Lucifer. They do not call him Satan. And as, they, as you well said, Albert Pike admitted that the true doctrine of Freemasonry is Luciferian. And so that's what he said in his monumental work entitled Morals and Dogma, which is issued to high-level Freemasons to be read and understood, that, that, it is, uh, that Freemasonry is a religion and Lucifer is its god, which is identical to the hierarchy the hierarchical beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible plainly tells us, speaking of the papacy, he says, the dragon, the dragon, that is Satan, gave him his seat and power and great authority. And, uh, and uh, they focused their attention on, on uh, controlling the kings of the earth. And... Uh, and, and, and that is so that the kings of the earth can control the world's people and uh, force upon us this anti-Christian or this Luciferian society that has come upon us. And it's because people have not taken the time to uh, investigate and find out who is the Antichrist in the world and how, who are his helpers. Well, obviously, number one, the Jesuits are, and just uh, the, the Protestant wing of Jesuitism is Freemasonry. And, uh, it's a hideous reality. It just cannot be overstated what a, what a travesty this is to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the movers and shakers of, of this mo- movement to recruit and use blind, deaf, and dumb Protestants to support a Jesuit or an anti-Christ agenda in the world for a new a new world government, are pro, uh, is Freemasonry. It's it's just uh, you, uh, well, I'll just leave it there, and uh, hope and pray God's people are listening carefully. Well, Tom, it is amazing how you take the words right out of my mouth when you were speaking about you cannot serve two masters. That was absolutely on the tip of my tongue. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat that right here because I wanted to say that too. But the point that um, that I wanted to make about your uh, differentiation between Lucifer and Satan being Lucifer being the original created creature by God, our Father in heaven, and after the fall being cursed into the pits and cursed onto the earth, uh, from that moment on called Satan. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, that is why. That is why I mentioned the point that Albert Pike writes in his Morals and Dogma that they follow Luciferian doctrine and Luciferian beliefs, and not satanic beliefs. For that, you have Anton Lavey, who is the founder of the Satanic Church here on Earth. I'm sure you have heard about him. Right. Well, certainly, certainly I have, but I want I want to uh, impress upon you a thought possibly that you may never have had, and that is that Anton LaVey is just a distraction. You see, no one's going to take too seriously anyone who worships Satan in a Christian country, okay? Anton LaVey was put forward, made public, made famous to attract all the attention of Christians away from the more subtle movement of Satan in the world, Freemasonry. And Freemasonry is Satan's main vehicle for, for, for reducing what was once Protestant America to an Antichrist nation. And, and as long as the attention is drawn away from Freemasonry, and its subtle clandestine operations in the United States of America, and focused on a showy, uh, 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 baseless, powerless, uh, 
uh, I don't want to uh, reduce myself to name calling. He's a showman. Let's just put it that way. Anton, Anton LaVey is a distraction and a very cheap one at that. Our attention should be focused on the Jesuits and their creation, Freemasonry. It's, they, they have a branch office in every city in this country, and they recruit Protestants to serve the papacy without their knowledge. And uh, Anton LaVey, when it, when it comes to uh, the damage that is done between the Church of Satan and Anton LaVey and the Church of Lucifer, Freemasonry, cannot be even compared. It, it, Anton LaVey is just a useless sideshow to attract the attention away from the real killers in society, and that is Freemasonry. I absolutely agree, and um, as long as you were speaking, I was trying to look that up because that was uh, a broadcast or two ago um, that I read about this, that the entry uh, to Freemasonry uh, are these um, rotary clubs. Yes, indeed. And um, we, I, I was reading that uh, a broadcast or two ago. I'm just looking that up here in the document, but you know this is such a long document, it's not so easy to find. Um, that is about uh, the Jesuit, um, uh, what's the name called, um, the Vatican and the Jesuits, and how uh, the Jesuit order is um, uh, infiltrated in our daily life, by the way. And there was this mentioning about uh, these rotary clubs, and uh, I think these rotary clubs are in 200 countries around the world. Yeah, so that means they're everywhere, and they are the first... Um, uh, yeah, the, the 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 first point of connection that the uh, that the Jesuits or the Jesuit organization makes with the lay people to put them into their organizations by, of course, uh, using the same esoteric and exoteric uh, policy of knowledge to their members that. The, you have the inside knowledge that is the esoteric, and you have the exoteric that is what's taught to the lay people. So that even uh, when you go into a Freemasonry, uh, you are very much aware about that, Tom. Uh, when you're a master mason of the third degree, you know shit. You know nothing about Freemasonry at all. Even though you call yourself a, um, a master mason. And I think they know it all, and they absolutely do not know, uh, do not know anything. They're only in the third degree. It's the same for people who join these rotary clubs and think that they are doing nice things because they are involved in charity programs and all that stuff, and they don't see what is behind these charity programs. For example, Planned Parenthood, which to the outside is a great, um, uh, is a great charity to help uh, people with so-called birth control in a positive way. But on the other hand, Planned Parenthood is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, abortion clinic all around the world. And this is yeah. esoteric and exoteric knowledge. And that's what they play out, of course, because not everybody is looking for the esoteric knowledge. They, the most people uh, are getting told, well, this is here and here for, and that is good. So they are in favor of, of things like this. I, I cannot find that about um, uh, about the rotary clubs how many that were, but that was the point that I was uh, that I wanted to make about that. You know. Yeah. Well, what you're doing is literally uncovering all the different layers of the onion that conceals uh, the Vatican's general direction for the new world order, and Rotary Club uh, factors heavily in this. Rotary recruits the movers and the shakers of every community. The most prominent people in every community are recruited into uh, Rotary. They're flattered to be invited to participate in this uh, Rotary organization, which is run, uh, amazingly as it may seem to people, and this will support the accusation and the claims that I've made about Rotary, and that is that it is run by Licio Jelly. 
was a former uh, grandmaster of the most criminal P2 Masonic Lodge in France. And now Leachio Jelly now serves uh, the Rotary Club as the Rotary International, which is which is uh, uh, a headquartered at the United Nations. Well, one of the most criminal personalities in our, in the modern era, Leachio Jelly, the, the the leader of the most diabolical P2 propaganda do uh, Freemasonic Lodge in France, runs or oversees. Uh, Rotary, and they recruit many times uh, Protestant pastors, the most powerful and respected people in the community, and uh, uses their influence in those communities to implement New World Order policy. Uh, they recruit this their way to infiltrate, yes. to infiltrate other belief systems, like uh, that was uh, what, for example, um, Rivera, the former Catholic priest, the former Jesuit who exposed the Jesuits and the founding of Islam through the Vatican uh, in, in the 80s and then later got killed. That's what, what he was brought up to, to infiltrate uh, any, um, yeah, as the Catholic Church states, heretic uh, denomination, so Protestant denomination, to infiltrate them and to bring them to the uh, bring them back to the so-called mother church, which is the Roman Catholic Church. That's the way they do it through organizations like this. They start at the bottom. It's, 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 uh, they they don't uh, try to put someone directly at the top of an organization. They start at the bottom and infiltrate from the bottom. Yes. Well, I, I view it as a total onslaught. onslaught. <laughs> they attack from all directions. And uh, it's Christ that they're ultimately attacking. The Bible is what they're ultimately attacking and replacing it with a secular agenda. And uh, and it's all done in the name of charity. That's how they get so so much support. I mean, yeah. Freemasonry. I mean, the sins that are committed in this world in the name of charity cannot be enumerated. No, I absolutely agree. But that's because you have the esoteric and the exoteric agenda of those organizations. That's right. And that's and what they... Uh, Helena Tr- Petrovna, Blavatsky, and Alice Bailey were simply, in this work that you're referencing, exposing it. Yeah. I mean, that, that work was for the esotericists. Oh, the yeah. elect, the, the, the... what they call the illumined ones. The, mm-hmm. or, the people who are are driving this new, this godless or this antichrist new world order agenda. And it's being done on the backs of, of, of witless Protestants. It's being accomplished on the backs of witless Protestants. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay, so we have had um, our first point. So uh, if you'd like to, I go to the second point, and we can also analyze that, or you can analyze that. I did that already a few broadcasts ago. Could I, could um, I add a little something here for you? Ah, hello, Wayne. Welcome. Hello. How are you, gentlemen? Great. Uh, Has Wayne been properly thing. introduced? Sir? Ha- has Wayne been properly introduced to the listeners? No, not yet. All righty. I don't need that, Tom. Well, then people know at least who you are. Okay. So okay. next next to Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, I welcome Wayne Michaels from the website Avenue of Light. Someone who seeks the light, someone who follows Jesus Christ, must know that website because it's really... Uh, a very great source of knowledge and a lot of things you can read about there and um, get very deep insight into the 666 Baal sun worship that is going on in this world. And I'm very glad to welcome Wayne into our conversation. Hello, Wayne. Hello, York. Thank you. Hello, Tom. Hello, Wayne. Nice to be with you. Thank you. You also. 
I just wanted to add a little bit here to you, beans. I have Pike's book here. That's all. Um, from page 321, it says the apocalypse is to those who receive the 19th degree, the apostasis of the sublime faith which aspires to God alone and despises all the pomps and works of Lucifer. Now, Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Not light, but darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning. Is it he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable blinds feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. For traditions are full of divine revelations and inspirations, and inspiration is not of one age nor of one creed. Um, it says on page 102, the true name of Satan, the Kabbalists say, is that of Yahweh, reversed. For Satan is not a black god, but the negation of God. The devil is the personification of of atheism or idolatry. Um, I'm, I'm almost done. So, Masonry, like all religions, all the mysteries for mysticism and alchemy, conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and the sages, or in other words, the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth, which it calls light, from them, and to draw them away from it. Truth is not for those who are unworthy or unable to receive it or who would pervert it. So masonry jealously conceals its secrets and intentionally leads conceited interpreters astray. So I just wanted to uh, add that to your conversation. I just thought that was... Yeah, thank well. you very much. Thank you very much because that uh, part of page 301, I think uh, it was that you stated, that was the one that I was referring to when I when I said that Albert Pike said uh, uh, that they are following Lucifer's, um, uh, Lucifer's religion and uh, that Lucifer is the head of all of their religion, doubt it not. Yeah, that was the one that I meant. Yeah, they call him the architect, correct. Anyway. Uh, the great architect of the universe, yeah. That's, I just want to share title. that with the listeners, that's all. Yeah, yeah. That, that's his title, great architect of the universe. Um, there's even a hierarchy uh, uh, painting. I mean, it's, 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 it's like a pyramid where on the on the top is uh, the abbreviation of the great architect of the universe standing there for Lucifer on top uh, on, on that hierarchy. Well, okay. A lot of places so, I've read where it has the G for Freemasonry, it actually stands for geometry. And uh, that's why the pyramid male pointing forward, upward, as above, so below, and pointing downward as the female. Right. So I'm going to go into the second point um, that Alice Bailey made on her 10-point strategy, uh, this charter. And the second point was reduce parental authority over the children. She said, Break the communication between parent and child. Why? So that parents do not pass on their Christian traditions to their children. Liberate children from the bondage of their parents' traditions. And how can that be done? First of all, promote excessive child rights. 1997 to 1998 in South Africa introduced child rights legislation, UNICEF Charter. Today, a child is able to say to a parent, I do not want to hear that. I don't want to do what you're telling me. Teachers cannot talk to children. Children step up and say, I have my right and you cannot talk to me like that. B, abolish corporal punishment. This has been made uh, law. 
On the other hand, the Bible says, do not withhold correction from a child, or if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs uh, 23, verses 13 and 14. Nota bene, Jesus said in the last days, wickedness will increase, there will be rebellion, and children will not obey their parents. It's not a trend, it is organized. Jesus even warned us of these coming in the last days. And another way how to push that agenda of reduce the parental authority over the children is to teachers are the agents of implementation. From workshops, teachers tell children, your parent has no right to force you to pray to, or read the Bible. You are yourself. You have a right of your own. You need to discover yourself. Self-expression, self-realization, self-fulfillment are all buzzwords. In the That's West, right. when a child is seven years old, the teachers begin to say to the child, you have a right to choose whether you want to follow the faith of your parents or not. Parents are not allowed to enforce their faith upon you. Question is, what type of decision can a seven-year-old make? End of, the, end of the reading here. And I think uh, what, what, what comes very clear in this last paragraph, uh, very clear, is the child, you are yourself. You have a right for your own. You need you this, you that. That's exactly the same that led Lucifer to rebellion in heaven when he said, I want to be like the Most High. I want to put myself there and that, you know. I, I, I. It's always about me. It's never about you. It's never about anyone else. It's never about God. That's what comes out very clear in this paragraph. So I'd like to have uh, your thoughts on this, Wayne and Tom. Woe to those that call good evil and evil good. I think the Jesuit order certainly has destroyed God out of the families, broken the families down. The divorce rate is just astronomical. And, you know, the women have no respect for their husbands anymore. They're making all these big job payments big monies, they're being uh, elevated in place of man because woman was made for man. No, I'm not a chauvinist. But that's what God set this uh, whole system up, so to speak. If you want to call it a system, I shouldn't say that. That's a terrible word. But, um, and they become swallowed with pride, just what we're discussing. And, you know, they, they don't want to adhere to anything the husband says anymore. And naturally, their their weapon of defense, of course, we really know what that is, and as soon as they don't agree with you, boom, hey, you're not getting on this, and then off you go, you know, and that's and that's a sad truth. But you know, most people don't want to discuss some of the things that I do, but, you know, reality is reality. That's right. And uh, on the divorce rates that you just mentioned, I think we'll come... Uh, to another part of this, uh, to another point of this 10 points, and I'm going to read where we come back to that. Because this all leads back to the 1960s, which, in, with, which in my opinion is one of the worst, if not, if not the worst, decade of the last century. Starting with 1963, when they take out the prayers out of the American school system, and uh, you have then that uh, sexual liberation, uh, you have that feminism going on, and uh, really, uh, put it into uh, first year, second year, and even third year in the same decade about destroying the family, which is it all about. So that that's when you destroy the family, Isaiah which 3 is, is all about. What? That's what Isaiah 3 is all about. If you remember me reading that to you some months ago, Isaiah chapter 3. Yeah, but uh, you're welcome to, to uh, repeat that here also for our listeners, Wayne. Well, I... Uh, I don't want to hog Tom, Tom's place here, you know. You're not holding anyone's place. You are a participant as much as I am and as much as Tom is. So I think that also Tom appreciates your input, don't you, Tom? I'm sure. Absolutely. So Wayne, feel free uh, when you want to uh, when you want to cite that, please go on. We are here about analyzing these points. I, I already did a show on that, but I did that on my own, and I'm very 
uh, grateful for that I have uh, two great minds like like you two here to explain that even a little bit more in detail to our listeners again, because this is something that we cannot talk much, uh, uh, that we cannot talk enough about, because this is really affecting our daily lives and not only our daily lives but also all the people's lives, uh, all the people surrounding us. Well, sometimes some of the things I say does not. Um I don't know, maybe come across well or it's not received well. But my intentions, I assure you, are for what the Word of God is saying. And I've lived this scenario myself twice. And um, you have yours also, and I'm not trying to peddle our business, but, you know, it's very much a reality today. And they get that money, and it's like, you know, what gains the man the world, he loses his soul. What is that money? Money squat, you know. So, um, I'll start reading that. I like to re- start reading Isaiah chapter 3, starting at uh, verse 8. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord, to provoke the eyes of his glory. The show of their countenance does witness against them. They declare their sin as Sodom. Um, they hide it not well unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say you to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given to him. Now as for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. For you have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. What mean you that you beat my people to pieces? We know who we're talking about here, don't we? And grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and they walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet, therefore the Lord will smite them with a scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. And in that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon. The chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings, the rings and the nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins, the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. Instead of a girdle, a tear or a rent. And instead of a well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty men in the war. And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. I think that's uh, pretty (laughs) self-spoken. Pridefulness and the haughtiness of women. And that's from the Jesuit order. They've changed society and uh, destroyed God's word, just like you said. I know how it affected my life and my marriage my children, and very visible. I'm not, I'm far from the only one out here, I assure you. Excuse me. Well, that was a good reading, man, and uh, absolutely appropriate at at this moment, and uh, really coming to the point 
not only of reducing parental authorities over the children, but also how women gained power uh, over men. Yep. And that was exactly what this feminist movement was uh, was in fact all about. I mean, when you when, when you go out there uh, into the world, uh, it is everywhere taught that everybody is the same. A man is as much worse as a woman, and a woman is as much worse as a man. They are going to take away the differences. And that is the teaching of man, because if God didn't want there any difference between men and women, he would have made them equal and not different, as he created them. Yeah, they're making the bathrooms the same now, you know, men and women both. Yeah, uh, in Berlin, in, in Germany, there is already a unisex toilet. Uh, it's a public toilet, a public bathroom, uh, where you have a door for men, a door for women, and a door for whoever, whoever wants to go in there, a unisex. Unisex door already. That, that, that's in Berlin, and um, I, I, I think you have the same, probably even in the United States also somewhere, I don't know, but I, I, I yep. know that you have that in Germany. Yeah, in the hospitals they have that in places. And, I mean, there's just no shame out here. There's no shame, none. No morals. About the most godless society we've ever had or been in this world, as far as I see. Tom, something you wanted to share about this point with us? Uh, I'd like to get back to the ten points that you were reading. The first one had to do with taking the gospel and prayer out of school. Yes. Taking Christianity out of the public school system. That they accomplished. The second, the second, uh, uh, it's kind of a one-two punch. <clears throat> it's not enough for them to take the gospel out of the schools. What they also had to do was break down the authority between the parents and the children and uh, give the children rights that God does not give the children in the Bible. The Bible says, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, who raises the child? The parent. The Bible says the children are to honor their parents, honor thy father and mother, that thy days might be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Okay? The authority structure in the family is hierarchical. The man is to love the wife and give himself for as as Christ did for the church. And the children are to obey their parents. The externalization of the hierarchy, this Antichrist uh, Freemasonic agenda, this global Antichrist agenda, not only not only takes the gospel out of the churches, but it takes the gospel out of the child's mind. It gives the child authority over the parents to reject the religion or the faith of their parents, and especially if it's that Christian religion that is, that is such a, a, a harmful, uh, uh, a harmful uh, rejection of antichrist okay and so it literally what it effect did was nullify the scripture taking away from the parents the right to teach the child and put that in the hands of the schools so now the school becomes the authority in the child's life and, the, and gives authority to the child to rebel against his parents, to rebel against the gospel that they're trying to teach him, and then make the child literally a cog in the New World Order wheel. And so it's, very, it's been very effective. It's been, it's been conducted by our education system and our legal system and our quote-unquote human rights system which is not of the Bible. It's the papacy's way of stripping from the parents any right to proselytize their own children and to raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, which is the Scripture. And it gives, it gives 
flesh and bone to the Roman Catholic canon law that says only the papacy has the right to educate children. And this is what they do with our children through the education system and through the court system. They make don't forget, don't forget the television. Well, certainly, every it, this is enforced in every uh, realm of media, and of course, you, you know, I don't want to divert into an, uh, 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 an extraneous discussion that takes the focus away from 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 this book that you're referencing here and its ten point plan to to make the world anti Christian. So they broke the bond of authority between the parents and put that authority on the schools where the papacy <clears throat> can make them anti-Christian. And the, uh, the Jesuit order and, uh, has recruited nominal Protestants through Freemasonry, and it is Freemasonry that spends a great deal of its time uh, uh, controlling the public school system in choosing which books are are on the pro, on the public school libraries which books are used in the classroom as textbooks they make sure that uh, that any reverence for the bible and christ is removed and uh, so it's a very effective hierarchical antichrist plan to cause the world to go the way of Lucifer. And, uh, you know, obviously we could get into a, a more discussion about how they even broke down the authority between a man and his wife, mm-hmm. and which Mike, uh, you know, Wayne uh, touched on. Yeah. But, but, the, but the point so far in these two items that you've mentioned from this 10 point plan is a one, two punch to isolate the children so that the state, which is the servant of the papacy can get, can become literally the parent and the priest and the pastor of the children. Absolutely. And And the gospel of Jesus Christ is excluded. Absolutely, Tom. And a very important point to mention right here is, for example, where I live here in Belgium, I don't know about the United States of America, but here in Belgium, children are giving to preschool from two and a half years on. Yeah, pretty much. Meaning they are just, they are just out of their diapers and they go into preschool. And from preschool, they go directly to school. That is... Pretty much the the children are giving in a very young age to the state, to the control of the state, by the educators in these preschools and by the educators in the school afterwards. And here in Belgium, we have uh, all day school. That means normal school children uh, attend school in the morning at half past eight, nine o'clock, and school goes until uh, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So they're done. Uh, they're, they're gone all day. Even stay over lunch, with no possibility to leave the school because it is forbidden to leave the premises, except you are 16 or even older. I don't know anymore. Well, that's that's pretty much the same here. What what is what is the quote the Catholics got? Give me a kid when he's five or whatever, and he'll be mine or something like that. Let's just don't simply state and restating, you know, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when yeah, he's old, he won't depart from it. So instead of raising up a child in Jesus Christ, they raise up a child in Luciferianism. Yep, absolutely. And they do it, and they do it through the state, through the educational system. And remember, it's a matter of Roman Catholic canon law yep. that the only legitimate state is a state which obeys the papacy. That is a de jure state. No, if, a state, if a state uh, uh, rejects the authority of the papacy and does not implement papal policy in its civil laws, then it is a de facto state, a de facto government. It's a government in fact, but it is opposed to the legitimate authority of government, which is the papacy. 
So at any time the papacy chooses to, a de facto state, a de facto government can be overthrown. And, of course, Rome has demonstrated her power to do that forever, and that's why, that's why uh, the states serve the papacy. And the states implement the papacy's education system or the Jesuit education system. Freemasonry helps that. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and Alice Bailey help that. And, and we see facts on the ground. The implementation of these, two, these first two planks of the New World Order agenda. Take the Bible out of the school. It's all about educating children. Take the Bible out of the schools. Raise up a child in the way he should go. Take the Bible out of the schools. And then destroy the authority that the parents, the teachers of the gospel, take that authority away from the parents and put it back onto the school. And make the, the students, the children, clones of the state. And Christ is completely out of the picture. As a matter of fact, the children can criminalize their parents if the parents resort to corporal punishment for this kind of outrage. A rebellious child, and as Mike alluded to, they fostered the rebellion of women against their rightful head, the man. Now, it's a little bit beyond the scope of, of what we were talking about, but it still applies and it's just a, a compounding of the effort to overthrow the authority of the family, which is supposed to be Christ-centered, and put it on the state, which is Luciferian-centered. And that goes all the way up to the papacy. I don't want to leave anybody in doubt. The papacy does not worship the God of the Bible. The, the papacy, the hierarchy, this which Alice Bailey is exposing in her externalization of the hierarchy is exposing that the hierarchy worships Satan. The hierarchy worships who they call Lucifer. They've rejected God's authority. They say Lucifer is the light bearer. He, that God was unjust to Lucifer to cast him out of, of heaven and to change his name to Satan. They reject God's authority. They rename Satan Lucifer, and then the, the papacy takes the authority from Lucifer and demands that all states, all governments overthrow the, the head of the house and the head of the man, Christ Jesus, and, and put Lucifer in his place. It's systematic, and it's considered orthodox now. I mean, how many Christians do you hear these days saying that, that the Bible doesn't belong in the schools? They're there to be educated. And and let them choose their own way in life. But they know? don't even believe Satan exists. Most people. No, many, today, many yeah. Christians. Well, and so so it has worked marvelously. It is even it has even not just corrupted the children, but it has corrupted the parents. It has corrupted corrupted the fathers of the of the household, which are supposed to be the spiritual guides. In the house, the responsibility of the gospel lies upon the man in the house. And that, that responsibility cannot be delegated. A man is either, is either performs his spiritual duty in the family or he doesn't. And, of course, in our society, they've taught that, the, that and I don't, you know, I don't want to get too far away, but, but who picks where the family goes to church? Who the picks where the family, who picks where the family uh, banks? Where, who picks, where's the, who picks the vacation? Wherever they do. <clears throat> yeah. The, the female. So, so, but don't miss the point. I mean, I don't want to get into a, no. an anti-woman discussion no, here. No, me either. No. Nope. But, but uh, it, it should be clear to the listeners by now that systematically, through the government-sponsored education system, the, the father of the house has been overturned, his authority. And isn't that what Satan did in the Garden of Eden? He didn't appeal to the man. He appealed to the woman. Right. She and, therefore he, and therefore, he overthrew the authority of the man because the man loved his wife. And he, 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 the man followed the wife. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And, uh, and, 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 and Adam should have uh, usurped his rightful authority in the family 
and, and said, Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not eat of the tree of the that is in the center of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You're a deceiver. Depart. And But no, he loved his wife, and his wife was beguiled. She was flattered. Satan said, you shall not surely die, but you shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. Well, how flattering is that to be said, you shall be as gods? And so Eve ate, and she gave her husband to eat, and he ate also. That's what the Scripture says. And Satan's still in the same business of overthrowing the rightful biblical authority of the man and the family, and even so much as, as, as taking the authority to raise the child away from not just the man, but the wife as well, and putting it on the secular state, the education system in the schools. You know, and, and there as soon as there's a problem at home, they take the kids and make them wards of the state. Well, that's what literally happens. I don't, I don't want to get into that discussion because it's it's going to take us clear off the path. But okay, but I, I want to I, stay focused on on exactly these ten points. Okay, and, I'll just say, I don't want I don't want to say wanna... one thing. <laughs> Project Vatican would be a wonderful study for anybody out there interested in what we're talking about. And I think an interesting point, which you were talking about, William Shinoblin mentioned that to be a high priest of uh, Satanism, you have to be a Catholic priest first. So I, I think I've exhausted the, the points that I wanted to make about these first two points in Alice Bailey's uh, uh, in, uh how they're one and the same, Alice Bailey and Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, in this work, uh, Externalization of the Hierarchy, where they're exposing the hierarchy. I don't want the listeners to miss the point. The, the work that you're referencing, the words that you're reading, are literally the expose of the New World Order hierarchy and how they're going to achieve their goal of, of overthrowing Christ, overthrowing the gospel, and making Lucifer the king of kings and lord of lords in the world through the papacy, through the state, through the education system, and with these particular 10-point plans. And let me interject something else here in this 10-point plans. When you are familiar with the document that is called the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, and to compare the 10 points from uh, Alice Bailey that we are discussing here, and you compare that to a lot of points that are mentioned in the so-called Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is not a Jewish document, but is a forgery by Abbe Bruel, who is a Jesuit, um, then you really see who is behind this agenda. It, it all comes back to the Jesuits again. It certainly does. The Counter-Reformation. The Jesuits are the Counter-Reformation. And how do you overthrow the Reformation? Take the Bible out of the schools, take the Bible out of the family. Destroy the, the parent's authority over the child. That's what they've done. They've implemented what Alice Bailey has suggested. And that's what they've done. It's become a godless society. It's become an antichrist society. Violence yeah. everywhere. It will, it will even be more come clear when uh, reading the third and the fourth point. Go right ahead. So I'm going to continue to the third point, that is destroy the Judeo-Christian family structure and the traditional Christian family structure. Why? It is oppressive. And that the family is the core of the nation. If you break the family, you break the nation. Liberate the people from the confines of the structure. How are you going to do that? A, promote sexual promiscuity. Free young people to the concept of premarital sex. Let them have free sex. Lift it so high that the joy of enjoying it is the highest joy in life. Fantasize it that everybody will feel proud to be seen uh, to be sexually active, even those outside of marriage. This is contrary to the word of God, which says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, 
as is fitting for saints. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and God. That's from Ephesians 5, verses 3 to 5. And point B, how to achieve this goal is use advertising industry, media, TV, magazines, film industry to promote sexual enjoyment of the highest pleasures in humanity. Have they succeeded? Have they done it? If you actually want to see whether they have succeeded or not, go to the advertising industry. It does everything to catch your attention. And today, almost no effort comes without the sexual connotation. Even when they advise ice cream, they must show you a thigh of a woman in a bikini. They must do something to set off a trail of thoughts. They will show you more thighs than ice cream. Why? Because that is what must be in the minds of the people. And nota bene, advertising industry pops out so much uh, pops out so much money towards the advertisements on the TV and radio. And something that is not mentioned here is, of course, pornography. And uh, I think the Internet is one of the best examples for that. I mean, they say that 80% of the Internet contains porn. I don't know. Um, I have been a lot of the Internet and uh, I haven't come across porn, but that's probably because I don't use <laughs> uh, uh, the right words when I, when I go on searches because I search something else. I don't search porn. But um, with the Internet access, that everybody can access the Internet, uh, even at home, the children can access it whenever they want to, if there's parental control or not. And then you have today these modern uh, media um, apparatus like iPad, iPhone, where you can uh, sc uh, stream television, movies, and everything on. Where is the parental control on that? If a child from six years on with his iPad can be online uh, when in school, when on the bus, when, when everywhere, even outside in the garden, I don't know, because there's uh, wireless Internet available almost everywhere. Where is the parental control of surfing, uh, what, what, uh, what sites this, uh, this child is surfing then on? So destroying the Judeo-Christian family structure is really a, a very important point because that is the lowest social structure that you have in, uh, in every nation. Uh, when, when, when you as a child have a problem when living in the household of your parents, who are the first people you turn to? Your parents. Now, if your parents are away, who are you going to turn to then? If there is no other relative to turn to, then you turn to the state. And that is what it is all about. I'd like your thoughts, gentlemen. Well, I'm just, I mean, did Mike have something to say? Go ahead. Well, it's just rebellion. The third plank is to, to incite sexual chaos, total rebellion against Christ, against the Bible, and its prohibition of lasciviousness. <clears throat> now, what happens in the family if a child becomes sexually energized at a young age? It gets involved with sexual activity, and an illegitimate child comes around, and then, and then, and then all the focus has to be on on this new child, this, this this child, and we have children raising children. Then it's a, at this point. And where is there the time for the gospel? Where is there time for correction now? Where is there time for further education? The man, the, the, the boy has become a man. He now has responsibilities. And, of course, uh, when they're not prepared, uh, too young of an age to take on those responsibilities, the child is neglected. And so the child becomes a ward of the state, doesn't he? And uh, that's exactly what the whole hierarchy is intended to do, is to disrupt the family. And if you can uh, 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 get the family order established before the, 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 the sexual partners are mature enough and responsible enough to take on those authorities, then the state has to do it. Or the grandparents have to do it. And it just adds chaos. And, of course, another call for the state to uh, interject itself into a sacrosanct 
uh, domain, which is the family. The family is sacrosanct. That is between the man, the woman, and God. And state, the state, the Antichrist state, interjects itself even w- with, by requiring a marriage license, which literally casts God out of the picture and puts the state in its place as the authority over the, the marriage relationship. And, uh, but I, I see this, but I don't, again, I don't want the listeners to miss the point. The whole point is the, the counter-reformation, anti-Bible, anti-Christ, and to impose a Luciferian uh, uh, order in the world, a satanic order in the world. And uh, uh, if you can cause a man or a young woman to violate uh, the prohibitions of Christ in the Bible uh, about, it, uh, about fornication, uh, sexual relations outside of marriage, premarital sex, if you will, uh, then they have accomplished their goal. Is it any wonder that God warned his people to live uh, uh, sanctified lives, not to be lascivious, don't conjure up, don't, don't uh, cultivate the natural God-given sexual desire in an irresponsible way because it will destroy your society and Satan will use this to destroy you. And that's exactly what they've done. Introduce uh, sexuality into the young man's life or the young woman's life before marriage. Hold them in a public school system until long after puberty so that this, this, this highly charged uh, uh, hormonal or natural sexual drive has a chance to fulfill itself before the marriage. And then all the illegitimacy that comes from it, it makes the state then, uh, gives the state an opportunity to inject itself in a, into a sacrosanct, uh, and, uh, uh, a sacrosanct uh, entity created by God, the family. And, uh, it, uh, how marvelously their plans have worked and how vividly apparent they are as facts on the ground. If anyone suggests that this, this, this 10 point plan by Alice Bailey and Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and, and Al- Albert Pike and all these esotericists, if anyone suggests that this 10 point plan is not being effective and not being effected by our own government, then I, I just don't see how they could be convinced. But the whole object of this is to overthrow Christ and the order that he placed in the body of Christ. And it has worked marvelously. And again, I'd have to say for people to check out Project Vatican because it's so fulfilled, including your preachers being Freemasons, the government heads, they've infiltrated everything out here. I'm not going to go sidetracking either. But. Okay, thank you very much, Wallace, for your insight. I'm going to read point four from ten. If sex is free, then make abortion legal and make it easy. She said, build clinics for abortion, health clinics and school. If people are going to enjoy the joy of sexual relationships, they need to be free of unnecessary fears. In other words, they should not be hampered with unwanted pregnancies. Abortion, as told by Christians, is oppressive and denies our rights. We have a right to choose whether we want to have a child or not. If a woman does not want the pregnancy, she should have the freedom to get rid of that pregnancy, painless and as easy as possible. Today it is not only accessible, it is forced. Today, abortion is a strategy to curb population control together with the use of condoms and pills. End quote. Well, there's not much more to say about that. Oh, yes, Uh, there is. Oh, yes, there is. (laughs) Oh, yes, there is. This is one of the most important planks 
I mean, this the, is the, point, one of, yeah, the, the point that I wanted to make here is, um, uh, I, I think we come across it a little bit later in these 10 points, um, sex is so easy for men because they can go away with it without any um, responsibility. And they force here unto the woman that they uh, also can have uh, sex without any responsibility anymore. That's why in the first place, and again, again I come back to the 1960s, the introduction of the anti-baby pill, the anti-conception pill, that was that time of the sexual free movement. That was to give the woman the liberty to have as many sex as she wanted without the repercussions of getting an unwanted pregnancy with it. And that teaching, of course, is mirrored uh, in today's society. Um, and, that, and that is at least my viewpoint of it. No, it is really, it is, it is, it is a very important point. I, I, I don't play that down, absolutely not. I just wanted to say this, is, this has to do with the uh, female liberation. Men were always free at that point because men could be responsible for whatever they did or they could not take responsibility. It was up to them if they wanted to take responsibility or not. A woman didn't have the choice. When she's pregnant, she's pregnant. That she said there was a problem, you know. The man never has that problem, let's say it like that. And that's what they wanted to take away. And they're right. Well, yes, but there's even more to it than this. And that is a point that is often uh, 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 missed in discussions about this uh, fourth plank. Make abortion cheap and easy, if not free, and encourage people to kill their own babies. Now, now here's the point that is almost always missed. What is taught in the Roman Catholic churches, the Church of Antichrist, what is taught? That the papacy has the authority over reproduction. And that Roman Catholics are are uh, instructed as a matter of Roman Catholic canon law that they are to bring Roman Catholic children into the world, as many as possible. They're not allowed to use any birth control of any kind. Uh, they'll, the Roman Catholic Church permits the rhythm method as a natural means of birth control, but that's as far as it goes, and we all know uh, statistics show us how how effective the rhythm method is, and that's why, especially uh, in my early days, you could count the Roman Catholic families in a community by the number of children they had. The Protestants might have had one or two children because they practiced birth control. But the Roman Catholics had six and eight and sometimes even ten children. And Rome knows that if birth control of any and every kind, including abortion, is available, that Protestants will practice it. But Roman Catholics are bound to obey the laws of the church. And it's simply a matter of, of, of uh, demographics that eventually a Protestant society will become majority Roman Catholic. And in a period of, of two or three generations, Rome will have the numerical advantage over Protestants. And this, this, is, an, this is a plan that has been put into effect by the Roman Catholic Church throughout its history. And, but that is uh, only possible. That is only possible because the Protestants don't follow the Bible as they should. Because otherwise, they would know that in the Bible it says be fruitful and, and multiply, and and they can also have a lot of children. But there are no Protestant families who live after the Bible anymore. You know. Yes. Well, if, all there, the... if there were, they would also have a lot of children, wouldn't they? Yes. Well, it, it just compounds the issue. I mean. I mean, Rome, Rome knows the effect that this, that this would have in making uh, abortion. Now, everybody says, oh, but Tom, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Roman Catholics uh, uh, protest these abortion clinics. They've even killed uh, d abortionists, uh, doctors that kill babies. 
uh, and, and, and isn't that what, but that's not what the hierarchy of the, listen, we're talking about the externalization of the hierarchy here. And the hierarchy wants, despite whatever the Roman Catholic Church says on its face, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church wants to make abortion easy and, if nothing else, paid for by tax dollars, by the state. And that gives the, the, the overwhelming advantage to Roman Catholics in demographics. Now, uh, in support of, of the thesis, I, I will simply tell you that in the book, The Vatican Billions, by Avro Manhattan, it was revealed that the Roman Catholic Church uh, was discovered to have been the, the main, the principal financial uh, uh, supplier of funds in the French country that first perfected the birth control pill. And, of course, that was made public. And, of course, the Vatican was, was embarrassed for having been caught red-handed in, in, in making uh, birth control available cheaply and easily and uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, make global this, this uh, demographic advantage. And uh, you can bet that Rome has never abandoned her efforts to make birth control uh, of any means available everywhere in the world, despite what she says publicly. And it is a plan that is, and by the way, before I leave the subject, you know, we've been taught that, that life begins at conception, haven't we? That we believe that, you know, you know, that the father knew us while we were yet in our mother's womb. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. We believe, we believe, uh, Bible believers believe that birth or that life begins at conception, not at delivery. Life begins at, at, at conception, the Bible says, and he went in unto her, and she conceived. Okay? So life begins at conception. That's what Bible believers believe. But did you know the birth control pill doesn't stop conception? The conception takes place. What the birth control pill does is simply makes the walls of the uterus so that it will not accept that conception and nurture it into life. So the conception takes place, and then the ovum, as, as they call it, the baby, literally floats around in the womb with no support. It starves to death, and it dies, and then it's flushed out with the menstrual flow. So Protestants, those who believe that life is conceived at conception, that life begins at conception, go about their lives impregnating their wives over and over and over and over again with every, with, with every uh, uh, lovemaking session, and a pregnancy may or may not occur for each one of these times, and the baby is flushed out with the menstrual flow. The dead baby is flushed out. Now, that makes Rome, the Vatican, the hierarchy responsible for incalculable deaths of babies. And it makes Protestants guilty of abortion. And those who say with their own mouths that life begins with conception, go about their whole life aborting babies. And that's how diabolical this hierarchy is. And if, and if, and if, and if it became public knowledge that the birth control pill does not stop conception, then Protestants would stop using it. But they never reveal the truth. The government keeps it secret, because it works for the hierarchy. The schools keep it secret because they work for the hierarchy. 
And the Protestant pastors keep it secret because they too work for the hierarchy. I understand your point, Tom, and I'm very thankful for that information because I didn't know that yet. But then I have one question. What is then the deal with the morning after pill? It just makes, uh, just makes abortion easy. Demoralizing the Protestant faith. Demoralizing the Bible. The bo- just, just remo- it's, it's total rebellion. I mean, we could go on and on and on about all the examples that, uh, that how, how a person can can uh, uh, d- destroy a life that was conceived, and, and and you know we could go on to uh, uh, even the brazen audacity uh, to exterminate a child in the birth canal upon delivery. Yeah, we are talking here in Europe already. I know it's from England. They want to pass a law that the parents can decide after the tw- first 28 days after the birth if they want to donate their children to science. And they are talking of uh, uh, post-birth abortion like that, killing babies that have even been born. Now, Roman Catholics according to Roman Catholic law, are forbidden to practice any of these things. So, so who, what, what are all these laws created to kill? Protestants, Bible believers. And just, so that's, why, that's why Rome has an, an exoteric doctrine and an esoteric doctrine. The exoteric, that which is external, which is public, is that Christians ought not to practice birth control. That they ought to have children, many children. But that is taught only in the Roman Catholic Church, and it's made a matter of a salvific issue. You know, if a, Roman, if a Roman Catholic is caught by his priest or his bishop practicing uh, birth control, or heaven forbid, uh, an, uh, an abortion, well, they're excommunicated from the church. And, of course, to excommunicate a Roman Catholic means simply that they are locked out of heaven. They're, con- they're condemned to a Christless eternity. They'll never get to go to heaven because the church has excommunicated them, and they can't get through the so-called pearly gate. They can't get through, quote-unquote, St. Peter if they're outside of the church. And uh, so this is of mortal uh, importance to every Roman Catholic, not to provoke the church to excommunicate them. So they, they, they have babies, lots of babies. And, uh, but the Ex, the, the esoteric teaching of the Roman Catholic Church is make it make uh, make birth control available and free, if not government sponsored. And then and then uh, Roman Catholics have I've made the point three or four times. The Roman Catholic Church has a demographic advantage that could be gained in in, in a matter of just a few generations. Yeah, it comes down to uh, do as I say, don't do as I do. Right. It's hypocrisy. It's the church of hypocrisy. You see, God's law <clears throat> does not factor in the Roman Catholic Church or its teaching. That's why it is the church of Antichrist. It's the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of Satan. That's exactly what it is. Wayne, you have something on that point you want to say? No, oh, I was just going to agree with him that, you know, that's why they are just trying to increase the Catholic population so greatly. I mean, that's another another way of doing that, you know. Yeah. And now they get all these Mexicans into your country, right? Uh, absolutely. Dropping the gate the down. Yep. And then they're all sun worshippers, so... Flooding the country with Catholics. Yep. And they're all sun worshippers, so. 
which is Lucifer worship. So. Now, Rome has, a, Rome has a controversy with her own people in this country. They've been around Protestants too long. And they no longer respect the authority of the papacy. And they no longer obey their priests and their bishops. And they practice birth control. So the papacy is losing the war demographics, or at least they're not gaining the ground that they had hoped to gain by now and making America completely Roman Catholic. And so to make up the deficit for disobedient Roman Catholics who practice birth control just like the Protestants do, it's just to open the southern border to the 98% Roman Catholics that dwell south of that border and let them come into this country and use, use our uh, social services at taxpayer expense. Yep. I mean, it's, it's, called, it's called a Protestant-financed Roman Catholic invasion of Protestant in America. And you have the same here in Europe. No doubt. With this multi-culti culture they teach on us. And people from all around the world coming in. I mean, after the Second World War in Germany and uh, some other countries like Belgium and all, it was uh, Italians, Greek, uh, were invited here as guest workers to do jobs so-called Germans or Belgians wouldn't do because they were working in mines and all that stuff. They came here as guest workers. But the majority of Italian people, what are they? The majority of Greek people, what are they? Catholic, huh? Yes. And uh, here in Belgium, then also, it, it started with, um, yeah, of course, because they have a little bit of other history, like in France also, uh, with Africans. Uh, and now it's uh, all about Muslims. And, uh, of course, Germany was very uh, in, in, in favor of that in the beginning, in the 60s. Uh, they imported a lot of Turkish workers into Germany. And today, about 10% of the German population is from uh, Turkish background. That's between 6 and 8 million people. Rome's strategies are global. And you can see that in every country. Yeah, You only have to open your eyes and look around. Yeah, I keep asking the people, why are, why are all these uh, Catholics in our government over here if we were founded as a Christian nation? You know, you know, they, they, they sell you that Catholics are Christians, aren't they? Yep. yep. That's one, of the one, one thing about it, we've been talking about the hierarchy. One thing we can all agree on, the hierarchy is not Christian. Absolutely not, no. It is as much antichrist as possible, I think. So, is there a point five to this thing? There is a point five. And that point five is make divorce easy and legal. Free people from the concept of marriage for life. Alice wrote 50 years ago that love has got a mysterious link called the love bond. It's like an ovum that comes out of the ovary as it travels through your system. It clicks of love, uh, it clicks a love favor in you, and there's one other person in the world who can respond to that love bond. When you see that person, everything within you clicks. This is your man, your woman. If you miss him or her, you'll never be happy until that love bond cycles past for many years. So for you to be happy, uh, get that person at whatever cost. If it means getting him or her out of that marriage, get him or her, just like an ovum comes up, and when it comes forth, you'll enjoy life again. On the contrary, God's word says in Malachi 2, verse 16, for the Lord God of Israel hates, uh, says he hates divorce, end quote. And a uh, little footnote, people enter into marriage having signed contracts of how they will share their things after divorce. People enter with one foot and another behind. Fifty years ago, divorce was unthinkable. It is one, it is one thing uh, for a marriage to fail, but it is another thing for people to enter marriage with intention to enjoy as long as it was enjoyable and to walk out of it. I think this is called a pre map right? Making up a contract, how much do you get, how much do I get, when we ever split. And again, I'm sorry, I have to relate to the 60s because from 1965 on, 
divorce rates in the United States of America and probably all around the world skyrocketed. And today you have, uh, I hear uh, numbers about 70 to 80 percent of new wet situations that end in divorce within the first five or ten years. Okay, brothers, your point of view. God I thought you want to go first this time. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, certainly God hates it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, absolutely. Uh, the Bible forbids divorce, and Moses only made it uh, a possibility, only made it legal yeah. because of the wickedness of their hearts. Now, yep. the, the divine law, the divine law says uh, uh, that they're married until death. Okay, it's a permanent relationship. Once it's consummated, it's a blood oath. It's a blood covenant, and uh, it's it's irrevocable, irrevocable. But according to God's law, that said that they were bound until death. They used the law and killed their spouse. Rather than work out their differences, they would kill their spouse, commit murder. And so Moses, seeing that the people were taking advantage of God's law, simply made divorce legal to prevent murder. And uh, certainly see that going on today everywhere. Murder. But the point. Where, where exactly does Moses do that? Uh, I don't remember exactly where that's recorded. Because the only thing that I remember is from I, when, when, there, when, there is, when there is adultery, when there is a, a woman going astray from a man, then he has the right to divorce. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm not familiar with any other uh, any other way there is divorce. Uh, uh, Mentioned in the Bible, and it's okay. No other way. No. And that must must be something in Deuteronomy or something. I don't remember exactly where it's, uh, where, where it was, where it's recorded in the Bible, but it's even mentioned in the New Testament. Yes, like three different places yes. in the New Testament. Yeah. Uh huh. <clears throat> that that Moses that it was it was not to be so. Divorce was not the will of God. But Moses made it legal to keep them from killing one another. And, uh, so. But look, uh, the hierarchy, once divorce available, easy, and free as possible. And, uh, of course, uh, you, you named all these things, but it's just open rebellion. And how did the state get authority in the marriage so that divorce could be easy and 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 uh, uh, available. I, I'm sorry well, to it, interrupt you here, Tom. I think it is in Deuteronomy 24. Okay. When a, man has, when a man has taken a wife and married her and it comes to pass that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it uh, in her hand and send her out of his house. Yes, and it was it stated elsewhere that this was never God's will, but it was a necessity because of the wickedness of their hearts. And when a man found something uh, in his wife that, uh, you know, such as adultery, uh, a breaking of that blood covenant, then in order to be free of this adulterous woman, he would kill her. And uh, one sin was leading to another. But, uh, but nowadays, but, but what, what, what authority then was operating in the, in the re- marriage relationship? It was God, wasn't it? It was God's law that, that set the limits for marriage, set the, the, the ordinance of marriage. But God's law does not uh, uh, does not rule over the marriage. Now the state does. It's the state that makes divorce easy and available. 
And how does the state get jurisdiction over a divine institution? By simply coaxing and coercing the married couple or the betrothed couple to kick God out of the marriage and put the state in God's place. And they did that through the marriage license. You know, licenses are given, according to the law, licenses or licentiousness is given uh, to do that which is illegal, to do legally what is illegal. In other words, gambling is illegal. But the state grants licenses to build casinos. Well, in that case, the license is necessary because gambling is, is, is illegal. And just, you know, we license, but, we, but the state has interjected itself. In other words, made the contracting third party the responsible or controlling uh, uh, authority over the marriage, not God, but the state. And they did it, they accomplished it through the marriage license. And once the two betrothed people uh, have kicked God out of the relationship and put the state in its place, God won't share his throne with the state. You, you, either, you either sanctify your marriage in God or you sanctify your marriage in the state. You, you, one or the other, you can't serve two masters. So when, when the licensing parties purchase these licenses and sign their names to them and make the state the ward of the marriage, God simply leaves. He, he doesn't stick around where he's not wanted. And, and so now the state is the authority, the controlling third party in every marriage. Did you know there's always three people in your marriage bed? The man and the wife and the state. And it was always supposed to be, it always was, at least in Abraham's day, in Adam and Eve's day, and every day in between, the third, par- the third person in, in the marriage bed was God. He sanctified the marriage. But now it's the state. And who does the state work for? The hierarchy. And so, and so uh, you know, uh, God steps out, the state steps in, the hierarchy's now in control. And now uh, uh, divorce is common and frequently, and that is to still overthrow the, the authority of the man, overthrow the authority of the parents over the children. And what we see here in, in all five points is to destroy the authority of the man, to destroy the man's relationship with God, to take the Bible out of his hand, to take the Bible away from him so that he can't even raise up a child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Do you see the consistency, the constant attack in all five of these points to overthrow the order that God established in the Garden of Eden between man and woman and the child? Absolutely. It's systematic. It is so apparent, and it ought to be apparent to the listeners now Who's really in control? Who is the name and the face, the, the pinnacle of this hierarchy? Who is the hierarch of this hierarchy? It's the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist. Our entire legal system is his domain. The civil laws of every land must comply with Roman Catholic canon law and must elevate him to sovereign, sole, supreme authority in the world, even over an institution that doesn't even belong to him, marriage. And marriage in the Roman Catholic Church is one of the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. The papacy openly claims sole supreme authority over the institution of marriage. And if you're married outside of the Roman Catholic Church, you've got to get a license. You have to get an indulgence to do that which is illegal. And they make it legal through the license. Do you know that in Roman Catholic Official Roman Catholic canon law teaching, 
that no one can legally be married outside the Roman Catholic Church? That, that, Roman, that, that marriage is a sacrament. It's exclusively owned by the Roman Catholic Church. And marriage outside of the Roman Catholic Church is illegal. And those who get married outside of the Roman Catholic Church, say in a Protestant church, har, 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 they have to get a license. The state is made the, the controlling third party in the marriage, and that means the papacy is controlled. And that's what makes the product of that marriage, the children, at birth, a ward of the state. Absolutely. And, of correct. course, that's reinforced That's reinforced by the birth certificate. I just when, wanted to when, say that's why you have the birth certificate. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. When did Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or any of the patriarchs, when did any of God's people ever, ever request a marriage license from the state? And yet, and yet we live in this world where... If someone suggested that you get married without a birth certificate, why, you're not a Christian. If someone suggests that you, you have a baby without a birth certificate, well, you're not a Christian. And yet, the whole, the, the whole economy of God indicates that none of that is necessary. Neither a marriage license nor a birth certificate. And that's the way that they have sucked God's people into being abject slaves, that the family has become an abject slave to the hierarchy whose, whose head is in Rome and whose head is in it's Satan, ultimately. It's anti God. Now, in Abraham's day, and, and, and every day up until the modern era, there was no need for a marriage license. The two families got together to make sure that there was no, no close family uh, gen- genetic relationship. They were not close kin. I mean, after law, after all, God set a law that uh, they couldn't marry near kin. So the two families got together to see to it that there was no close uh, blood relationship in in, uh, obedience to God's law. And then literally the two parents set the children off to the bedroom and closed the door. And they they weren't allowed to come out until the marriage was over. The marriage took place in private. And God was in the midst they were bound by a blood covenant. And uh, that means nothing today. It's been completely overthrown. And the papacy is the ultimate authority in every marriage because it claims itself to be uh, the replacement of Christ on earth. And Roman Catholic canon law makes gives the jurisdiction of marriage to the Roman to the Roman pontiff and no one else. Okay, the state is simply an administrator for the papacy. That's why they have to issue licenses. And if they can convince God's people that they ought to go to Satan and get a license to do what God says is lawful, then they cast God out. And isn't that the point that is made in all ten points of this plank? For the new world order, the externalization, the 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 making manifest what the the hierarchy dictates, and their hierarchy is Satan himself. And of course, Satan is a spirit, and he has to have a human agency through which to work, just like God is a spirit, and he has to have a human agency through which to work the body of Christ. That's how the that's how Christ is made manifest in the world by his body, his believers, Satan likewise, has to have a human agency through which to, to, to foment his plan. And who is that human agency? The papacy and the papal hierarchy, including the Jesuits. And they are the masters of every state. 
That's why the states all conform, the nations all conform to Roman Catholic canon law by issuing marriage licenses and birth certificates. So the whole world has cast out Christ. I cast out Christ when I got a marriage license to marry my beloved. I, but nobody told me I was casting out Christ, and I wasn't spiritually taught because my parents were no longer to teach. The school was to teach, and the school taught marriage licenses. The school taught birth certificates. I wasn't raised up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I was raised up in a godless, secular school system that was designed to serve Satan and his human hierarchy in Rome. We are all deceived, every single one of us. What Alice Bailey is putting forth in this book is facts on the ground. And everybody ought to, if you want to know, if you want to know how Satan has gotten control of God's house, just read that book, The Externalization of the Hierarchy. You want to see Satan's plan for the destruction of the body of Christ in writing? That's where you find it. I need to take a three-minute break. I'll be back. Okay, Tom. Thank you very much for your contribution. It's very high appreciated. I can tell you that. Wayne, do you have something to continue on that point? Well, I think he's covered that too, you are. You know. <laughs> uh, so. I, I, I couldn't have said it any better, really. <laughs> Yeah. It's uh hey. it's a it's a sad state of affairs the way this world is. And he's right about the children being wards of the state. As soon as you sign that license, boom. They may be even before they're born, they're wards of the state. You know, and I've tried to tell this to many people and they just look at you. I said, Read the back of your marriage license. It's like your home when you sign a, a lease for your home in the small print there or whatever, you never own it, you're leasing it. Yeah, that's right. You know, because the Pope owns everything there is out here, according to them. You know, of course, that's this this world, and that's his. So, you know, and uh, it's sad how duped the people are. They have no clue about any reality whatsoever out here. And and everything you buy, you you still buy with this fake money, of course. Anyway. Yep. Yep. Which is which is not money, which is not credit. Yeah. Nothing else. You know. You have a very special dollar bill, <laughs> or some special dollar bills. <laughs> we have a very special euro bill. I, I guess nobody told you that, but when you look at the euro bill, there is not one word that states that this is money. Uh, there is not stated one word that this has any value, but there is on the top left, in different European languages, the word European Central Bank, in short, ECB which you have in German, EZB, and in the ECB, and, and things like that. And next to that is a little sign, a little, a little circle, and in that circle is a little C. That a is what? a copyright sign. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is all that is on that euro bill. And any, everybody accepts this euro bill as being valid, as being money. It doesn't say that it is money, you know? Before we had the euro and we had our European currencies, um, there was a text imprinted, at least I know that from the German and from the Belgian money that I used at that time, that uh, this is legal tender and when you, uh, when you forge this or when you distribute this into public or when you uh, distribute forged bills into the public, you will be punished by uh, imprisonment of at least five years. That was stated on the money. And today we only have the value imprinted on it, like 20, 10, 50, 100, 200, or 500, whatever. And then next to the European flag, that is on the top left, uh, the, uh, the abbreviations of the European, European Central Bank, BCE, ECB, EZB, EKT, and EKP, and this copyright sign. And that's all a copyright sign. I like to add a some interesting insight. We're talking about divorce rate and destruction of the family. Uh-huh. Guess who the top ten nations in the world are as far as percentage of divorce rate? I think Germany is one on the top. 
I would think here would be probably the number one is Belgium at seventy one percent. Next is Portugal at sixty eight percent. I wasn't then it's too far over my seventy percent then, yeah. And then Hungary is uh sixty seven percent. There's a point behind all this I'm gonna to get to. Mm-hmm. Um <clears throat> Then we got the uh, Czech Republic at 66%. Spain at 61%. Notice a lot of these countries I'm mentioning are very much yeah, Catholic. <laughs> Luxembourg is uh, 60%. Estonia, 58%. Cuba, believe it or not, is ranked 8th at 56%. France at 55%, and then the United States at 53%. So my point being in all this <clears throat> and bringing that up is is the fact that you'll find an interesting statistics worldwide where, although in Latin America it's a little different, but a lot of the uh, quote-unquote Western world Run by Rome, controlled by Rome, you have a very high di- divorce rate, also a decrease or decreased marriage rate as well. So I'm sure you recognize it in your own country, York. I recognize everything that you just said. But here in Belgium, absolutely 100%. Yeah. But it's not just I'm not knocking Belgium, it's just because it's Belgium. It's like the heart. It's like part of like the heart of Western Europe. It's just a reflection of what all Western Europe is. In England, is a very high. It's it's in, it's in that. I'm not surprised they didn't have that England in that ten percent or ten highest countries because when I was there, and that was twenty years some years ago, they was sixty percent. Well, first of all, sixty percent of all couples were not getting married, and. Um, that's what's happening in this country, too. You know, it's just a reflection of what I see is what the Roman Empire is all about, period. Yeah. And in particular, when you look at the, the Northern Hemisphere portion of the Roman uh, Empire, huge amount of, of a divorce rate. Um, saying that, too, though, you can look at some of the other countries and other statistics, and you got Russia... It says marriage and divorce rates per thousand population. If you look at the number of people getting married and the number of people getting divorced, there's been a huge reduction in both of those based on the fact that how many few people are actually getting married. But Russia and the United States uh, rank some of the high, the two highest when it comes to people not getting married and divorce rates. Yeah, uh, and so we look at that. You know, it's this is a global. It's not just the United States, and it's not even just about Protestantism. It's not just an attack on the Protestants. It's an attack on the whole globe, family unit. Period. Same. You know. So, and then if you look at the top ten of this other graph. Once again, it's Russia, United States, Lithuania, Cuba, Czech Republic, Estonia, Belgium, Switzerland, Denmark, um, uh, Latvia, uh, South Korea, Australia, Finland, France, Hungary, Germany, New Zealand, Norway, Australia, Austria, excuse me, Luxembourg, Sweden, Portugal, uh, uh, Slavica, Japan. Notice that Rome's involved in all these countries. <laughs> in Netherlands, the Bulgaria, Poland, Spain, Romania, and then China, way down there about the 20th, and uh, then Greece. Interesting is you get Mexico is like the 25th ranked, Ireland and Mexico. So we look at Mexico and Ireland, which is mostly populace is mostly uh, Roman Catholic. There's a difference between the populace being mostly Roman Catholic and the government itself being run by Roman 
I'm noticing. So those folks that were the it's the populace is mostly dedicated Roman Catholics. There is a reduction in divorce rate, but at the same token, and they also there's a very low number of people actually getting married. Where is Italy standing in this? Uh, this thing? What's that? Uh, where's Italy in that list? Well, Italy it has a very low. It's way down there. Uh, it's got like a. Let's see. Let's see. Volta has like a. A point eight percent. Let's see. Let's see if we can find a different list with Italy. Um. I did see one where Italy was very low. Um. Because I think this is the most, the most Catholic country that we have in Europe. But like Malta is like 0.1%. Yeah, but they all have uh, very few people living now. So. Yeah. Italy, oh, wait, I, I've lost it, but it wasn't very high. It was like 3 or 4%. It was not very, it was, a, I think it was like 7%. But uh, don't quote me on that until I find it. Not much anyway. No, but Italy is a say is a very similar to a lot of these countries where there's a very low marriage rate too. Mm-hmm. So you always have to see the two in, the, the two points in connection, right? Yes, there is a connection it's between. You don't have many marriages in the first place, and you can't have many divorces on the other hand. But in other words, just uh, I mean, I hate to say it, it's a combination of me and my own. But I, I have a son that I had, you know, out of wedlock, and there's a lot of kids in the United States and throughout the Western Hemisphere, or the Roman, I call it the Roman Empire, who have that are being born out of wedlock. People are just not bothering to even get married. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, and it's just uh, stats. It's it supports basically it does support your argument. It supports what you're talking about as far as that article and. You know, how they're destroying the family and how, you know... the point about the free sex, you know? And even then when you don't get an abortion, okay, then you get uh, get the child, okay, but you don't marry, you don't divorce, you just live together or even that not. And you just go on with your life and you have children and you put into this world with a birth certificate, of course. Yeah. And uh, But you have no family anymore. It's with this freedom of uh, with this freedom of the sex they're giving the people and say, okay, you don't need need the family anymore. Yeah, and, and, and then, if you got any problems, the state is going to take care of it. And another element in all this too is the fact that what they've done is they've created a situation where most people, in order to get a quote unquote good paying job, they have to leave or extended family, the place where they were born, and go somewhere. Like in the United States, I know so many people, the majority of people that I even grew up with, do not even live in the town, the region, or the state that we were raised in. And a lot of them live on the other side of the country and vice versa. And that's another way that Rome has uh, destroyed the family. And I see that not only happening in the United States, but I see a lot of foreigners. They're bringing a lot of foreigners doctors and all sorts of folks from, you know, whether it might be Pakistan or India or whatever, they're bringing them over here. It's all about destroying the family and just destroying the family nucleus, which is not only just the man and wife and the kids, but it's also, you know, the grandparents, your aunts and uncles. And these are all important, important part of the family. And, you know, I don't know my aunts and uncles. I'm not close with my siblings, and the only reason I know my parents is because I chose, I, in an early age, I said, you know, I, I realized it was important to, to know my, be there for my, my parents, which turns out to be biblical, and it's part of honoring, my, you know, your parents. <laughs> it's just not run away from them, but be there for them to the best of your ability, you know, and you're doing that as well with your mother, and, um, you know, but I see that happening in this country and globally, we're, uh, you know, we're just throwing our parents under the bus, our grandparents under the bus, our children under the bus. And, of course, now we know why from this discussion and previous discussions. It's been a deliberate attempt to destroy the family nucleus. 
Yeah. But I find I find it interesting that a lot of the when it comes to the northern hemisphere, those countries that uh, have the lowest rate of of marriage and the highest rate of divorce are also under the control of Rome. But yet, in Central and South America, which is called Latin America for a reason, <laughs> it has some of the, the lowest rates of divorce, but at the same token, doesn't have a very high rate of marriage either. So, I don't know. It seems to be, it all seems to coincide with what you gentlemen are talking about, the fact that there is a deliberate attempt to destroy the family and a global basis, a global worldwide basis. Absolutely. Okay, let's see if Thomas back. Yes, and it just uh, you know it proves the point. The Vatican is 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 where all this chaos comes from. The destruction of the family. It comes from the hierarchy seated at Rome, and all the while publicly, uh, the, the 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 teaching of the Roman Catholic Church publicly is. A family that prays together stays together. And, of course, what is that prayer? The, the rosary, <laughs> which is anti-Christ. It's all anti-Christ. All of it is. And, uh, you know, and Rome also had a hand in, you know, what was the nucleus, of, what, what kept the family together? Well, the lamb did. You know, the family farm. That's how aunts and uncles would maintain close relationships with the rest of the families, because they all worked the ground together. They owned the ground. They had their own wealth. They had their own, uh, uh, you know, way of sustaining themselves. Now you have to have an employer. You have to work for somebody. Why? Because they took the land out of the hands of the people and gave it to the state. And now it's in the hands of big corporations. And uh, so now we, we have to move from place to place to place wherever we can find a job. The, the family is completely fragmented. The system was designed from the very beginning to destroy the family. How is the body of Christ perpetuated between parents and children and children's children? And, and they, they, they all stayed together. They all farmed the ground together. They all supported one another. They had their own means of sustenance. They raised their own food, and they protected one another from the onslaught of Satan. So they took the hand, they took the land away from them. Now there's nothing to keep the family together. As a matter of fact, there's every motive to keep a man moving. You know, the average family moves five if they stay together. The fam, the average family moves five times in the life of the parents. Five times. So where do you ever, what, what do you call home? What can you call home? You see, they keep them alienated, keep them on the run, keep them from planning, setting down roots, setting down their support structures, setting down their, setting down their defense structures, setting down the Bible and grounding and rooting the family in the Bible. It's all an attack on the Bible. This is the counter-reformation. This is the Jesuit-led counter-reformation and it's being exposed by Alice Bailey, the externalization of the hierarchy. They're telling us flat out what they're doing to us, and it's up to us to decide who is the ultimate target of everything they say. Who is the ultimate target? Christ. And that's why it's anti-Christ. Can argue with that. Antichrist, Antichrist has his mark on all of us. A hundred years ago in this country was about 80% of folks lived on farms, agricultural-based communities and on farms. And what is it now? Do you know? Oh, I, I hate to even hazard a guess. It's got to be just in a few percentage points. I agree with you on that. And, of course, even that land, if it's privately owned, if it's truly privately owned, it's taxed to oblivion. And listen, that that simply tells us that, you know, if if the government, if the state, if the hierarchy has the ability to tax, 
it has the ability to remove the land from the possession of the people. If they can tax the land, then then God no longer owns it, the state does. And that that that's that, that's been the design of, of of the entire Gentile history. Well, do you want to go on to point six now, Jorg, or are you? Absolutely. If you're uh, still on with me, then uh, I can go on to part six. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Make homosexuality or sodomy an alternative lifestyle. And as Bailey preached 50 years ago, that sexual enjoyment is the highest pleasure in humanity. No one must be denied and no one must be restricted how to enjoy themselves. People should be allowed in whichever way they choose to, uh, they want, whether it's homosexuality or an incest or bestiality, as long as the two agree. A law passed in South Africa. Parliament had, has passed it on 26th of January in 2000, and the president gave it a signature on the 4th of uh, February 2000, giving so much freedom to gay rights that a time will come when it is illegal for a preacher to mention homosexuality as an abomination in the eyes of God or to read scriptures publicly that talk about homosexuality. In Mozambique, 1994, an agenda was drawn targeting to fill the police force, the judicial system, the education system, and everywhere else with gays, so that when a case came up, they are to defend the cause. Today, the church is expected to marry gays and lesbians. According to the Bible, this is an abomination before the eyes of God. Leviticus uh, chapter 18, verse 22, chapter 20, verse 13. Of course, I'd like to refer to homosexuality more as sodomy, because that is the actual biblical term that is used for it, and that is the actual term that, uh, well, to day for most people is of course offending when you use sodomy but well uh, I like to speak the truth and I like to say the word as they are and homosexuality is sodomy so why not address it the way that it is and, if, and, and I'd like um, to just say one thing York just for yeah. your listeners please get an encyclopedia and look the word gay up please look the word gay up I don't have it in front of me but I assure you it doesn't mean uh, the, as far as I'm informed, this, the word gay was uh, something beautiful, um, like, like an opening flower or something like that. Yeah, it was joyous. Yeah, so, so something joyous, yeah, something positive. Yeah, yep. Absolutely, but they, they uh, turned that around, of course. Uh, war is peace. Huh? I'd like to I'd make another point. I have looked up the word sodomy in many dictionaries and especially online Bible dictionaries. And guess what? Sodomy isn't even listed in those dictionaries. I just wanted and, to say, not to be and, found. <laughs> yeah, and, and in some places, sodomy is listed, but it's not defined. So if you go to a dictionary and look up the word sodomy, you're likely to find the word not even listed. And even if it's listed, it's not defined. So they want to erase from the world the definition of sodomy, and they want to erase from the world the mind of the world that God has already judged it and destroyed the sodomites of Sodom and left it for an everlasting testimony to those who engage in such things. And what is never mentioned about sodomy is, is, is uh, the link between idolatry. And I've already given I've already given that lesson. So what is the ultimate goal in making sodomy legal? Idolatry is legal. They go hand in hand. And what do we what do we find in the Roman Catholic Church? What do we find among the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church? Idolatry. The churches are full of images and idols. They venerate images and idols. They pray to images and idols. And their priests are sodomites. I rest my case. Destruction of the family, upsetting of the of the, of the natural use of the woman, 
for abject perversion. But what is the target of all this? God and his law. The negation of God, the overthrowing of his law. And Satan has, in this our day, exalted himself above the stars of God. He now sits on the mount of the congregation. He now is like the Most High. Why? Because God's people obey him. Here I am sitting in the breadbasket of the United States of America in Iowa, the most conservative state, or at least I used to think the most conservative state. I figured the last one in the United States to make sodomy legal. And here we are, sodomite state. It's, it's just, I mean, how, how, do, how, do you, how do you avoid the vision of, of fire and brimstone raining down upon us? And, and, and who wants to make sodomy legal? Who wants to make bestiality legal? Specifically, specifically forbidden in the scriptures as an abomination. Who wants to make it legal and commonplace? The hierarchy, the hierarchy whose head sits in Rome and who is, has become a plague all over the world with this pedophile and sodomite sex a scandal that is seemingly helpless to do anything about it. Why? Because she won't do anything about her idolatry. And so since you can't, you can't find, they can't simply read the scriptures and find a solution for their sodomite plague. And they will not repent of their sins. They simply try to mainstream it. So it's not considered a sin in the world. That which God calls evil they call good. That's the whole, the whole plan of this 10-point plan is to overthrow God. Everything is directed at destroying God, his law, the Bible, and Christ. It is Antichrist. And Alice A. Bailey and, and Helena Petrovna Blavatsky openly admitted their Freemasonic connections. And anybody who does any research into this knows that Freemasonry is just the Protestant wing of the Jesuit order. It's, it's just incredible what's taking place. Uh, but talking about bestiality, uh, having sex with animals, that is legal in Denmark. Did you know that? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yep. And there is even... Uh, tourist business from the northern part of Germany to go over the border to Denmark to practice bestiality. The money machine. Now, if, if Rome, if, if the Ro Rome would do what she has always done and raise up a crusade against a quote-unquote heretic nation, Why hasn't the Pope, if, it, if the papacy is opposed to bestiality and sodomy, why hasn't Rome do, done what it always does and raise a crusade against this heretic nation? Because Rome supports this. Ultimately, the esoteric, uh, uh, the esoteric belief and teaching of the Roman Catholic Church is sodomy, bestiality the overthrow of the rightful throne of God in the world and his law and his people. Look, if Satan had his way, he would destroy us all. And right. how would he most effectively destroy God's people but allow Satan's agents to preach from the pulpits There's and to allow the Roman Catholic Church, give the Roman Catholic Church authority over all the churches? And that's what the ecumenical movement did. There's another sensitive point that I have to make in, 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 in this uh, subject, and that is probably the legalization of pedophilia. Because when you look at what is happening right now, and uh, I, I sent Michael 
yesterday or today a video uh, on uh, the United States of America uh, the, um, in relation to the organization that is called Common Core of the early sexualization of children. And this is something, there's a big agenda that is going on here in Europe for the moment, in uh, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, where children, even in the kindergarten, are told to undress and uh, touch each other uh, everywhere in the body, even at their genital parts, and to discover each other. Four year old, five year old children in kindergarten. And they have sexual education with porno movies for 10-year-olds in school. And um, there was a case uh, in, in Germany where a child, uh, I think it was a girl from 9 or 10 years old, couldn't stand this early sexual, uh, sexualization uh, lesson in school and she went out of the classroom. And her parents got fined, her father got fined for to pay a fine, and he didn't want to pay the fine because he said, I understand that my daughter didn't attend that, and I don't want her to attend that, and he has been sent to prison for that. So are they, or are, they not in, are they or are they not implementing all these planks of Alice Bailey's externalization of the hierarchy? I Facts on the ground. That. I this, well, I, I speak this for your listeners' sake. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I know what you know. You're, I mean, I'm not asking you. I, I'm, I, just, I just want to reiterate to the listeners. Christ has been overthrown. Right. And, and here we have Alice Bailey admitting who's behind it. And all you have to do is research her background to find out who she ultimately represents. The most powerful institution in the world, the richest, most powerful, most influential, most diabolical institution in the world, the papacy. I'd like to interject something when you're done. Please. Okay. It's from Book of Romans. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'll read one thing. If you read it slowly, I think it has uh, quite a point to it. It says, so as much as in me is, Paul speaking, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Anyway, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools look around us. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and to birds, four-footed beasts, and the creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lion, worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. And for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves that recompense for their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, 
without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That's the first book, first chapter of Romans. And there's the link between idolatry and sodomy. Mm-hmm. Cause and effect relationship. That's right. I'm going to go on to point seven. Or is there still something you wanted to say about this subject? No, I, I think I think we fairly well covered it. And uh, for the listeners' sake, I guess we're going on uh, two hours and 43-some-odd minutes, and uh, I think we ought to keep going. Okay. So point seven is about debase art and make it run mad. Promote new forms of art which will corrupt and defile the imagination of people because art is the language of the spirit. That which is inside you can bring out in painting, music, drama, etc. Now look at the quality of music that is coming out. Look at the films coming out of Hollywood. And not only the films, not only the movies, but think of the television series that they have and that you can stream online today or everywhere on your computer everywhere on your mobile device you have don't have to be anywhere and if you missed something you can later on download it or stream it later on this is absolutely one of the most important points that we should not use that is not about art alone but that is uh, the movies and the television series and the television and the use of the television and the use of the mass media that they do that that is debased. There is not one Hollywood movie, I think, anymore without any sex in it. And I just want to give you a a little example of it because I I find it really funny when you think about that. When you think about 60 years ago, so somewhere in the 1950s, I I, I think there was... um, uh, even the poster of, of this movie with with a woman like I don't know Rita Hayworth or whatever, and one of the big female movie stars at that time, and uh, she was giving a big peck, a big kiss with a guy in a movie, and people sometimes even at that time went out of the cinema and said, "This is an abomination. I can't take this. They are showing this kiss. This is so pornographic." And today, uh, if people are laughing about this, about a kiss, you know, how can that be, um, yeah, being debasing? Uh, but in that time, people had other moral standards. And there you see how the whole system, how this whole hierarchy uh, really succeeded in the last 50 or 60 years to change our morals. Of course, that comes a little bit back to the gay uh, gay agenda that we were just talking about and the pedophile agenda and the bestiality and all that stuff, but also in, 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 in art, uh, painting, music. Well, listen to the music, listen to the musicians today. And I'm not only talking about this hard rock uh, like ACDC and things like this. This is already long known for a time, but think of all this uh, rap music that came up the last 15 years with stars like, stars like Eminem and I don't know, and listen to these texts, and then you will really see how Satan has infested himself in every kind of art, which is the language of the spirit, which should be nice, which should be an impression of beautiness of, and, and, and beautiful things, and how all this is twisted and turned around. Okay, I leave it on to... Well, I'd like to make a comment about that. Okay, we look at the Super Bowl halftime ceremonies has been going on for a while now, but we pay attention to the past half a dozen of them, how progressively it's become more occultic and more satanic. And guess who's going to be the feature headline artist for the Super Bowl this year? I have no a self-proclaimed Satanist who does not hide it, 
It has videos explicitly about it. Katy Perry. I just wanted to say Lady Gaga, but okay. <laughs> so you know, it's 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 so blatantly obvious what they're doing when it comes to the arts and the media, and, you know, with, uh, music, is that they have progressively, in my lifetime, at least, if, if year by year, which each new megastar, new each new famous artist or musician becomes more and more open, out in the open, that their allegiance to Luciferianism or Satanism. Surely a very, good example, yeah, a very good example, sorry to interrupt you, but a very good example, I think, is Kesha with the song uh, I Want to Die Young and the message that was brought about by that. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it's, it's so much in your face, it's amazing. So. That's all they talk about, singing about is death. The most Listen. brutal, gruesome manner of death there is. And these kids are doing all these things. They're going in their closets and hanging themselves and just unimaginable things. Things that we wouldn't have, couldn't have conceived of in our minds when we were children. It's just, you know. And another point I'm going to bring up that's a little off subject but not is is – the growth hormones are putting in all the food that we have out here and these children. These little girls out here, man, when I was coming along, there was one girl in school who was developed. You know, one. Seriously, one. And look at them today, 11 and 12 years old. I mean, <laughs> unimaginable. Yeah, but that's also because um, all the hormones of the anticonception pill in the drinking water and all the hormones anyway and all this medicine that is in the drinking water that has not been filtered out, right. that also has a very much influence on that. I saw a documentary some, uh, some days ago about the femalization um, or, or even the twitterization means making two genders of fish. But there are a lot of fish right now in many places um, that have the two sexual organs or the two sexual um, expressions, like, like male and female. They have uh, female eggs and, 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 and male, uh, and male sexual organs. Yeah. I don't doubt it, York. I, you know, it's why God destroyed it the first time. I think because of the DNA tampering. So many anyway. Look, I uh, I know this subject, could, this particular subject, could go on for three hours, at, by, all by itself. Yeah, it's, that's it. I mean, it's limitless. But let let me get back to to the root of the, of the thing. Alice Bailey said, "Listen to what she said. Art is the language of the spirit." Now I asked my Christian brethren, "What is the language of the spirit?" It's the Bible, isn't it? And that is what, exactly what they're trying to overthrow. Now, Alice Bailey represents the hierarchy. And where do we find the greatest art collection in the world? The Vatican. They own more art than any individual uh, art collector in the world. The very walls of the Sistine Chapel are, are, are an artist's canvas. And what does it promote? Pedophilia. Idolatry. Pedophilia. It, yeah. Idolatry, pedophilia, everything. Look at the walls of the Vatican. Art treasures, incalculable wealth. Art treasures. And what each and every one of them represent is the overthrow of the authority of God in the world and making idolatry the Christian religion. And uh, uh, Alice Bailey, the hierarch, says art is the language of the spirit and God's people know that the Bible is the language of the spirit. It's God speaking to man in writing. It's spiritually discerned. But Alice Bailey says art is the language of the spirit. And where do we see the biggest art collection in the world? In the Antichrist Church of Rome. The head of the hierarchy. And it's all forbidden. Every bit of it. So these other things that you're talking about are just as valid for the discussion as what I've brought forward. 
but I don't want to lose the, the, the reality that Rome is the author of all, of all this idolatry. That's why I found it a little amazing that Paul said he was going to include Rome in also. Well, when you look at the, the different industries that we're talking about, whether it's music or drama, Hollywood, even painting, you know, we're talking about canvases and that kind of stuff, still life. Who's actually running all this? Who's the major shareholders in all these different large organizations, they say, in, in Hollywood? Who uh, runs most of the, the music industry? Oh, most of the Malta. Knights of Malta. And, yep. Oh, but it's, it's, yeah, but it's also none of that. You got the Freemasons, Knights of Malta, all under who? The okay. Jesuits. Well, Je- Jesuitism by any other name is still Jesuitism. And Freemasonry and Knights of Malta are both, connect, are both controlled by the, uh, the, the, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, known as the Jesuits. Their hierarchy is the Jesuits. And, and they all are just wings of the Jesuit order. And here's another question. Uh, which uh, university, a Jesuit one, is claimed to have produced more actors and filmmakers and uh, drama you know, professionals? They claim this to be. I don't know, personally. Most hey, we'll think well, Washington D.C. George not Georgetown, is it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you mean that? <laughs> well, you know, and it doesn't make any. It does. It's not very surprising once you understand how they've used drama, how they've used the theater, how they're the ones that have been backing all of this for how many hundreds of years. It makes all the sense in the world. So. What, what drama and, and theater and all of it is, is literally uh, uh, the, the unlearned, uh, look, right, let me just put it simply. The Jesuits teach spiritual formation, visualization, and, and uh, self-deception. If you study the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola, you'll know that every Jesuit is put under a, a, a rigorous uh, uh, curriculum of visualization, imaginings in the one's own mind. In other words, they throw the Bible away and they try to visualize God. They try to visualize Satan. And, and they conjure up their own reality. It's a form of, of, of brainwashing and mind control. And, and since we're not all Jesuits and we are not, we, we, we are, uh, are not likely to submit ourselves to Jesuit training, <laughs> especially those of us who know what the Jesuits are all about, we're forced to do the same thing through entertainment, the visualization. In other words, uh, we don't have these visualizations ourselves. Je- the Jesuits make it real easy for us and giving us those visualizations in the form of artistic expression. And so each and every one of us are being indoctrinated and mind controlled through these visualizations that we find on the screen. And we've simply, we simply, we are being, we are being self deceived by submitting ourselves to this indoctrination through visualization, theater, television, and uh, uh, art. It's a completely diabolical reality that is formed in our mind, a complete perversion of the gospel truth that is given in the Bible, and preparing us for a a Luciferian society. And so, so if we we can't fully comprehend what Hollywood and all of these venues of artistic expression are unless we know about the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola and Jesuit training. They're simply subjecting us all to Jesuit indoctrination 
through visualization in the arts. And Alice Bailey knew all this when she wrote this book. Hey, Tom, I have a question for you. Yeah. Did Brother Walt ever send you the book that I sent him to send you, The Jesuit Agenda and the Evangelical Protestant Church? I don't think I've seen that one yet, but uh, I'm, I'm certain that if he, if, he, uh, if he has forgotten it, I'll remind him. But anyway, what was your comment about it? Oh, nothing. It's, the only thing I will say, you read it, it's good. Uh, they leave out the fact that Antichrist is all the way through history to the first pope. They just mention the one coming to be set up in Jerusalem. Yeah. And I contacted the author, and I never got a response, and I didn't expect to. So. so, Yerk? Yes. Point eight. Very, very interesting, and I guess after that, we will go on at least two hours discussing just that. <laughs> but before I read point eight, I will read a quote from our beloved Anton LaVey, <laughs> which we mentioned already before, from The Devil's Notebook, page 86, because it absolutely has to do with point eight, which is called Use Media to Promote and Change Mindset. So the quote from Anton LaVey is, quote, Television is the major mainstream infiltration for the new satanic religion. The TV set, or satanic family altar, has grown more elaborate since the early 50s, from tiny, fuzzy screen to huge entertainment centers, covering entire walls with several TV monitors. What started as an innocent respite from everyday life has become in itself a replacement for real life for millions a major religion of the masses, end quote. Now I directly start reading point eight, so use media to promote and change mindset and keep in mind what I just told you about the television, which, funny enough, he calls satanic family altar. Alice Bailey said, the greatest channel you need to use to change human attitude is media. Use the press, the radio, television, cinema, you can tell today how successful they have been in implementing the plan over 50 years via media as well as advertising agencies, billboards, and magazines. Who controls media? So much money is pumped into media and advertising, spreading of pornographic material and other sources. Sex outside of marriage is thrown on your face 80 to 90 times than sex in a marriage. Promiscuity is being promoted as natural. You watch gay sex on television in homes where children's minds are being neutralized to sensitivity to those things. You wonder why newspapers, television, etc. do not record anything about Christian activities? End quote. I, I don't think it needs elaboration. I think we've already talked about it enough. The media is just another canvas <laughs> for artistic expression. And uh, they are saturating us. Every, uh, every media, every art, every means of communication, every mode of operation is used to indoctrinate. Or most, most, most specifically, to remove the gospel and any knowledge of God or his law or his salvation from man's mind. I absolutely agree, Tom, but the point that I want to make is still something else. With this satanic family altar that Anton LaVey here says, I learned some years ago, some three years ago, I saw one of the lectures of Alan Watt from the website Cutting Through the Matrix, who stated in that broadcast that the invention of the television, there was one person involved that you probably all know. The one who wrote, Do as thou will shall be the whole of the law. Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley. A Freemason. A Freemason. And when you 
Read and the, and guess, guess who they used? Walt Disney, a 33-degree Freemason. Yeah, also, yeah. Well, he, he has the magic kingdom. Magic not, not, kingdom. not the heavenly kingdom. Yeah. Not the heavenly kingdom, the magic kingdom. The magi kingdom. Yeah, the magic was the CK magi. for the people who listen. Yep. Yep. Exactly right. And they got control of the press through a Roman Catholic uh, Hirsch family. Or the, uh, the uh, uh, William Randolph Hearst. And uh, the CIA, uh, look at his pro- Project Mockingbird. The CIA was even admitted by, uh, uh, what, the governor of Min- Minnesota, what's his name, uh, uh, the wrestler. Um, um, Jesse yeah. Ventura. Jesse Ventura. Yeah, and I'm not promoting the Jesse Ventura. He's just as deceived as everybody else. He's but look, he, he, worked, he worked for special forces. He worked with the CIA. And how did he refer to the CIA? He called it Christians in Action. And, of course, Christian is just another name for Roman Catholicism. Yeah, and, and Project Mockingbird was a CIA effort to buy up the media in this country and to make it Catholic. And William Randolph Hearst was just part of that. Uh, the, the, the mainstream and the alternative medias are ultimately owned by the Knights of Malta. Absolutely. Hollywood, Hollywood is run by the Knights of Malta. The CIA is run by the Knights of Malta. Nearly every other CIA director was a Knight of Malta. Well, Rome the controls the press. Rome controls Hollywood. Rome controls every mode and every means of communication in this country. And the indoctrination is wall to wall, and it's anti-Christ in its character. Well, Bill Donovan founded the CIA, and he was a Knight of Malta. And another interesting connection to the Operation Mockingbird of the CIA that you mentioned is that Alex Jones from Infowars.com or Planet, I don't know, all his websites, but Infowars.com is one of his websites. He is part of uh, the CIA Operation Mockingbird. And he is, one, he is the one who pushed... Uh, Jesse Ventura into his show with uh, several interviews uh, in the time, uh, I, I think some, uh, some two years ago. I even have two videos from Jesse Ventura from that time uploaded because that time or three years ago, because at that time I didn't have the knowledge that I have right now. Uh, but there were videos from Jesse Ventura that I had, and uh, they were pushed by uh, Alex Jones. Yes, and Alex Jones is a show for the Vatican. If you Go to the Alex Jones uh, website and, and do a search for any article in his archives that contains the words Knight of Malta. It'll be, it'll, your, your search will be ejected. They, they, they will not allow you to search Knight of Malta in their documents. Or exactly. Jesuits, for that matter. Yes, try it yourself. I did it myself. I heard somebody make that accusation. I thought, oh, come on, that's uh, going a little bit far. So I went directly to the website, and I did a search for Knight of, Knights of Malta, and my search was, was kicked. Yep. Huh. Try it yourself. Ventura, he exposed the Jesuits being behind Wall Street. I saw that, and I was pretty shocked about that. Yeah, yeah but you know, that. once CIA, always CIA, and he was... Uh, uh, Navy SEAL or something like that. He was in yeah. some kind of elite uh, military unit for years. Yes. And uh, he never left the CIA, don't tell me that. On the other hand, when he got governor for Minnesota, he said that he didn't do that with uh, support from big companies and all that stuff. Uh, are you going to tell me that just anybody can become governor like he did? He had uh, people who, who backed him up at that time, of course. That's right. That may, <clears throat> I don't want to get on another tangent, but look, this, 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 this whole electoral process in this country, I've got, I've got to ask the question to the listeners who've already heard eight of these ten points. If voting had any power, they wouldn't allow us to do it. 
Yeah, there's a saying, if the elections changed anything, they would have been forbidden. Well, I got something I'll throw to that. When I was in Maryland before I came here, Ronald Reagan was in office. A CBS News reporter went to the, to the voting polls and went out back, and there were dumpsters lined up one after another where they had been dumping the, the ballots right into the dumpsters. And I was 18 years old, and I said, well, I'm never going to vote again. I voted the first time when I was become legal, you know, in their eyes, whatever, just to see what it was like, you know. Never again. I've never voted since. So. But Roman Catholics are hauled to the voting booths yes, they are. by their churches, sure and are. they're told to, with, for whom to vote. And that's why Rome controls politics in this country. The Rome gives the appearance that the, that, the, that the voting booth is a useless waste of time. Protestants stay home. Catholics are bust to the voting booths. Well, a very good example were the elections of 2004, weren't they? With George W. Bush on the Absolutely. Republican side. And, and, John Kerry, and John Kerry on the other side. And they were both members of Skull and Bones. Yep. Secret Society from Yale Jesuit University. Yep. And you know that guy who interviewed Bush about that? Yeah. yeah. He's been yeah, they fired killed, after they that. They killed him. Oh, they <laughs> killed him. Yeah. That was uh, Russer. Yep. Russer. Jim Russer. Russer. Jim yeah. Russer, yeah. Jim Russer, yeah. He, he was a graduate of Boston College, Jesuit Boston. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, he went too far, exposed too much. He went too far, yeah. Yep. That's right. Yep. George H. W. Bush was a knight of Malta, so was George W. Bush. The hierarchy. Representing Rome. The the CIA director during nine eleven was George J. Tennant, the knight of Malta. Devout Roman Catholic. But Ronald Reagan was Roman Catholic. He was Irish Roman Catholic. He came from a long line of Irish Roman Catholic families. It was a very powerful family in Ireland. Ronald Reagan was Catholic all of his life, and so was his wife. Ronald Reagan was made an honorary Knight of Malta during his administration. He was also made an honorary 33-degree Freemason. Ronald Reagan was the most deceiving president that I've that ever has ever been. Uh, but, but, you know, they all try to one-up one another. George J. Chenet, director of CIA during the George W. Bush administration, directly responsible for 9-11 to, to launch another Holy Roman Crusade against the heretic Muslims. And guess what? The Pope sits on his throne in Rome and sees heretic USA, Protestant USA, fighting and dying, paying with their blood and their and their and their treasure to fight another group of heretics in the Middle East. And all of it is nothing but a strategy of the Vatican to secure the Middle East for the Pope's eventual reign of the world from Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Absolutely. And I have another interesting point to say about um, Ronald Reagan. Not only was he, of course, a Hollywood actor, and we know who Hollywood controls, <laughs> But also, he was the president who re-established uh, um, uh, political relationships with the Vatican. All roads lead to Rome, and it's uh, information uh, that uh, is just not talked about in the Protestant churches today. They completely are oblivious to what the Protestant Reformation was and what the Jesuit-led Counter Reformation was and is, and that's how all this takes place right before our very eyes, and nobody has a clue. Do you realize how important this program is to God's people? I mean, I, I hope that people have are beginning to get a concept of 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 what's being exposed here. Well, I hope so too. Our our goal is not to do this for our fortune, but for the fortune of God and Jesus Christ, and not for us, but it's all for him. And every soul that we can reach and that we can save from this satanic matrix Jesuit system and 
the devil who wants every living soul in his possession, every soul that we can rescue by doing this program here, is a soul one for God. And that's our goal. That's why we're here. Okay, where were we? Point eight or nine? Nine is coming up right now. And um, point nine is called Create an Interfaith Movement. There's your ecumenical movement. There's your ecumenical movement right Mm -hmm. there. The unification of all the world's religions under one single solitary religious sovereign. And that's the Pope of Rome. It can't be anybody else. I made uh, two videos on one world religion, the wound is healing. In the second part, uh, I posted an article and and, uh, read an article about this house of one that they are building in Germany which is a uh, place of worship for Islam, Christians, and Jews together. Yep. The house of one. And who's left out? Christ. Of course. Of course, Christ is left out, yeah. But um, that's a very interesting one, because, you know... The Catholics, uh, who call themselves Christians, for them that is made, and for the Muslims that is made, and of course uh, the Vatican invented the Muslims, or the Islamic faith, let's say. And um, also in the same video I'm speaking about this religion that is pushed by Rick Warren, that is called Chrislam, which is the merger or the fusion of Christianity and Islam. And by that, of course, we are not talking about uh, biblical Christianity, but uh, Roman Catholic Christianity. Yeah, he preaches a works gospel. He preaches a works gospel, and it is completely devoid of grace through faith in Christ. It is completely devoid of the gospel. In the okay, I'm going to read point now. The Temple of Worship for the listeners out here. I'm going to read point nine now. Alice Bailey wrote, promote other faiths to be at par with Christianity and break this thing about Christianity um, as being the only way to heaven. By that, Christianity will be pulled down and other faiths promote, promote it. She said, promote the importance of man in determining his own future and destiny, also called humanism. She said, tell man he has the right to choose what he wants to be and he can make it happen, as he has the right to determine his course. This takes God off his throne. We have seen in South Africa hosting a meeting of interface movements in Cape Town led by the Dalai Lama. (coughs) Excuse me. Well, I can only add to this that we have had this meeting in 1986 and 10 years later on again in 1996 um, in um, Italy um, that was at the the place where this um, uh, Francis, what was his name? Francis of Assisi lived. There you have that interface movement. Uh, There are video outs with John Paul II who was uh, the Antichrist at that time with a meeting with the Dalai Lama, with uh, uh, Indian shamans, with Buddhists, with uh, representatives of all congregations all over the world. Uh, there are pictures out on the internet when, uh, that you can look for where the Pope kisses the Quran. And what does that say to you? Well, I leave it up to you, brothers. Please. Now well, that's your ecumenical movement. That's uh, the Pope being heralded by the leaders of every religious cult in the world, the Pope was announced to be the spiritual head of them all. The harlot and all of her daughters all gathered together at Assisi, Italy, to proclaim the Pope the spiritual leader of the world. That makes him the man of sin, doesn't it? That makes him the man of sin, the son of perdition. That which, by by preaching Christ, opposes Christ. The abomination that desolates.
Well, I'm going on to point 10, because that's a very short point. And that point just states, get governments to, mar to make all these law and get the church to endorse these changes. Alice Bailey wrote that the church must change its doctrine and accommodate the people uh, by accepting these things and put them into its structure and systems. Those were the ten points. Okay, all of these hierarchical points are being imposed upon the people through the civil laws of every land. The beast, the Bible calls the king and the kingdom a beast. And the papacy has erected itself as king of kings and lord of lords in control of all the governments of the world. And if all this is now facts on the ground, we have to conclude that the new world order is already up and running. It's not something that's going to happen. It's something that already has happened. And I will conclude simply by saying that the new world order is simply the old world order restored when the papacy controlled all the kings of the then known world. And uh, they call it the dark ages, but there's no age ever so dark as the current one. And it's made in the image of the old one. Spiritual darkness, most and for all. because they took God out of the equation. If you want to, I can read a little summary of this text, which I find quite interesting, and then we can maybe give our final thoughts after that. Are you right with that? Yes, fine. Okay. The question here in the text is, have they succeeded? Well, we were discussing that all, all the way along, but I'm going to read it to you right now. Today you wonder why your government, uh, <clears throat> governments are legislating laws contrary to the Bible and why the church is compromising the word of God. It is a process of implementing the plan, a 50-year strategy of the New Age movement to fulfill its ultimate goal to establish a one-world government, a one-world economic system, and a one-world religion. Today, the strategy almost in its entirety has been adopted by the United States and today a lot of it is already in law in many nations. This deception has crept up unobserved on so many people. <clears throat> it can best be demonstrated through the well-known analogy of the frog in the pot of water. If you put a frog in a pot of boiling water, it is smart enough to know that it is in terrible danger and will immediately jump out of a safety. But if you turn up the heat very slow, a little at a time, it doesn't notice the changes that are taking place and it will slowly cook to death. Many people today are slowly cooking to death and don't seem to realize how far they have come from where they once were. Today, the Western world is not struggling to resist this because the New Age movement focused primarily on the West because that was the Christian world in the 19th century. The New Age movement has a school called Akani School, which is a school of all the leaders of the Western world. They subscribe to it. It is recorded that they say they have succeeded in the task <clears throat> in the West, but suddenly they realize Christianity has migrated to the rest of the world, so they have now to use every resource of the, of the West to deal with the rest of the world. In Africa, South Africa is the number one state. It is changing at such a rapid speed. They are saying give to African states a financial package which conditions, which, with conditions to legalize abortion and take God and prayer out of school. Governments are so attracted to this package, they can't say no to it. They need the money. They ask the church to find an answer. These are done secretly. Christianity is 5%. The rest is Hinduism, Buddhism, and Spiritism. New Age is being taught to teach us they are being taught to teach this in schools. It is interesting to notice. Uh, it is interesting to note that Blavatsky, Pisson, and Alice Bailey were well-known Masonic leaders of the day. Albert Pike referred to Freemasonry as the custodian or special guardian of these occult secrets and revealed the hidden agenda 
of his institution, the forming of a Luciferic one world government. The final thought that we should consider, take a good look at the world around you today and think about how things have changed since May 2010 and refer back to the opening statement of this blog and how unbeknown to so many of us we are being consumed by a most malevolent hidden virus. So this paper was from 2010. And I'm going to end with a little quote from a certain Paul Warburg, who is known to most of our listeners, I think. He was one of the founders of the Federal Reserve Bank, a German banking house from Hamburg, I think. And he stated, we will have a world government, whether you like it or not. The only question is whether that government will be achieved by conquest or consent. End quote. That's like the quote from the United Nations where uh, I can't call his name right now on the tip of my tongue because I had treatment today, but he swore that everybody would take an in Luciferian initiation or not be belonging to the New World Order. Remember me reading you that quote? It's off of Walter V's presentation. Well, it doesn't ring a bell right now. I read it to Michael. read it to you. Uh, Spangler, David Spangler. You sure you read that to me? Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. Oh. I'm sorry, then I had forgotten that. You probably could pull it. I'm not sitting at the computer, so you probably could pull it up. David Spangler. <clears throat> yeah, I can look that up. So, very short quote, but I think it's pertinent to what you're finishing with here. David Spengler, right? Yes. Okay, I'll make my closing statement and then I'll dismiss myself. What my part of this discussion was simply to put a name and a face on the New World Order. I think this discussion has accomplished that. No longer can we blame the New World Order on nameless, faceless organizations, such as the powers that be, or they, or them, or the elite, or the rich ruling elite, or uh, corporations, or this or that. We've all heard them, and what they all serve to do is, since they do not put a name or a face on this new world order that anybody can identify. It strips from us any responsibility to do anything about it. But now we have a name and a face. And therefore we have the responsibility to do something about it. Satan is the ultimate antichrist. He is a spirit. He has to have a human agency through which to accomplish the conquest of God's rightful throne. He does it through the papacy. The Jesuit order has been assigned to be the militia of the Pope, to conquer the world for the Pope. And as asked one time, the Jesuit general was asked one time how he how the Jesuit order, such a meager society, could accomplish that conquest of the world. And the Jesuit general simply said, we rely on multiplying forces, multiplying agencies. And we've named for you, we put a name and a face on all those multiplying agents. Freemasonry, Skull and Bones, virtually, I won't name them all, Knights of Malta, Knights of Columbus, and all the secret societies, even the Greek-lettered literary societies in the colleges, secret societies, oath-bound organizations that use secrecy and deception to accomplish their works, societies that recruit Protestants to help conquer the world for the Pope, 
We've named them. We've put a face and a name on them. Satan, the hierarchy is number one, Satan. Number two, the papacy. Number three, the Jesuits and all the secret societies that the Jesuits control. We've named them and we've put a face on them. Now we have a responsibility and we dare not shirk that responsibility. Is to shirk that responsibility is to deny Christ. And I'll conclude with that. Thanks for having me, and I'll see you next time. Thank you very much, Tom, for your attention today and for your input. That was very, very valuable. You know, some weeks ago, I did already the same broadcast with the same article, just with Michael alone, and uh, we enjoyed ourselves very much. But the input that you brought today was very insightful, and I hope that a lot of listeners will enjoy also our broadcast that we did. Um, Wayne, do you have some closing uh, remarks? Some no, closing I was just hoping you would have looked that article up and found that little... Well, I found just David Spengler, and, and that's all. But uh, I don't know if I, write, uh, if I wrote him right or whatever. Uh, he was born in 1954, something. No, the, quote, the quote stated that nobody would enter the New World Order without taking a Luciferian initiation. Okay, looking on the quote. Michael, are uh, you there still? Yeah, I'm here. Do you remember me reading that to you? Uh, Restate that again, please. I was focused on something else. David Spangler made the statement. I got got the quote here. Okay. Uh, No one will enter the New World Order unless he or she will make a pledge to worship Lucifer. No one will enter the New Age unless he will take a Luciferian initiation. David and Spangler. David Spangler. Yeah, I wrote the name wrong. I wrote it with an E instead of with an A. <clears throat> I didn't see that, so. United Nations. Yep. That's pretty 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 powerful there to come out of the mouth of the UN and everybody thinks you know this is such a a wonderful government here. Well, they need to dig deeper, like Everything we stand for, against, and teach, there's only one government that's not on this earth. That's of Jesus Christ in heaven and his Father at the throne. And everything here is corrupt under Satan's hand, like Tom said, through the Vatican. Um, the Jesuits' whole purpose was to set up the counter-reformation, to destroy the freedoms that God given right to man to worship God as he sees fit, and not under a rule of authority under a man wearing a dress and red tennis shoes. <laughs> so any final thoughts from you, Wayne? No, that's it. Okay, then I thank you very much for contributing to our broadcast this evening, and I hope I can welcome you again one of the next ones. It's always nice that we have a change of uh, wisdom, and I very much appreciate your input. Uh, Michael, thanks very much for giving me and uh, our brothers here the platform that we can Uh, do this very interesting information and uh, give this on to our listeners. And um, by that, uh, I will stop with, um, well, in the name of Jesus Christ, I hope that we will have a lot of more opportunities, broadcasts like this. And um, I thank my personal Savior, Jesus Christ, and my Heavenly Father, God in Heaven, that we have had the possibility today And uh, God bless you all, and uh, bye-bye. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, gentlemen. And Wayne, yeah, I do remember about David Spangler. I remember we took looking him up and talking about him. So, Um, yeah, uh, tonight, folks, 8 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll be talking with uh, 
James Arndt of jamesjapan.org or .net, excuse me. And uh, that should be another interesting interview. A uh, couple side notes. Earlier I mentioned that Georgetown University was uh, the number one Jesuit college in, the, in America as far as the dramatic arts go. It is true. Uh, hopefully I meant uh, that's what I meant to say. I don't know if I made that clear. What is it? Georgetown is the second most important university as far as dramatic arts goes. Uh, the first would be inside New York City. But on top of that, if you look at Washington, D.C., we start with, with inside Washington, D.C., it was called Little, uh, Little Rome with all the many universities. Then there all the, the, the dotting uh, Catholic universities throughout Washington, D.C., like George Washington University, Georgetown, Howard University, American University, the Catholic University of America, the University of District of Columbia, Johns Hopkins University, on and on and on. And the River Tiber. Yeah, and the River Tiber. And you realize that, you know, Washington, D.C. really is the center of everything that goes on in this country. And then, of course, there's uh, New York, which is also known as the in a certain section of New York City is called the Little Vatican. It's also very much influenced, influenced not only in politics and finance and all that kind of stuff. So, um, on the other side thing I wanted to bring up, we were talking about the influence of Rome on the world stage. Guess where prostitution is uh, legalized or uh, permissible? the most, which, you know, continent or geographical regions are number one as far as prostitution and being, being, being legal and or not being prosecuted. First is South America. There's only two small little countries where it's illegal for prostitution. The rest are either, are either legal or are, are, um, are regulated and also with South America is Central America then it's Western Europe then it's Canada believe it or not in the middle of all that is the United States which quite it's not quite yet been legalized my point in bringing that up is once again is another fine example of what happens to a culture to a society to a whole continent when it's run by Rome when we're talking about the number one in prostitution is Latin America. So another example of how the depravity and the perversion that goes on when Rome takes over. So something else to think about. Anyways. And that's why so, God has to destroy this earth by fire. Because I think you're getting you polluted here. The kingdom of heaven will be destroyed because it's polluted there because Satan was there. It's got to be all made new. Yeah. I think you're right, my friend. <laughs> um, oh, by the way, that, that article that you sent me uh, from from uh, Milton William Cooper from uh, IlluminatiSomething.com, I don't know if you remember sending me that or not, yeah. but I ended up reading that on a show, uh, a couple shows prior to. By the way, uh, the other thing is today, this show was actually the official 50th show of Nothing But The Truth. So I'd like to thank all of you who were part of it, York and Wayne, and Tom was left already, but thank you, thank you, Shadow Girl, thank you for the other guests who popped in and out, and the people who will listen in the future, thank you. And, uh, and, um, Hopefully this helps somebody and, and, and helps more than just somebody, but a whole bunch of somebodies. <laughs> and and I, with that, and I, can, I hope people will take the time to look up Project Vatican, study what's okay. on there. Yes, yeah, so, and not only that, look up Project Vatican. Uh, don't forget Wayne's website, Avenue of Light, Yorg's talk, uh, talk uh, not talk shoe, YouTube channel called Jugular 66. Uh, Tom's uh, radio show is online called uh, 
and Inquisition update. And um, and uh, with that, I wish everybody a good day. For those who will still want to join us later on, and at 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll be talking with James Arnett. So everyone have a good day, okay? Thank you, Michael. Bless you.